Welcome to a Alt Shift X live stream to discuss House of the Dragon episode seven. And uh, my God, things are rapidly spiraling out of control. Uh, the the battle lines are truly being drawn between the Greens and Rhaenyra's side. Uh, we had this this wonderful confrontation between Alicent and Rhaenyra after their respective children uh, assaulted each other and an eye was cut out of Aemond Targaryen's face. Uh, we, after Aemond had claimed Vega, the largest, most powerful weapon of war in this universe, is now in the hands of this, of this child, <laughs> of this angry little blonde kid. Uh, he is now in control of uh, the world's biggest nuke. Vega the dragon. Um, so we've got a whole different sort of dragon situation now. Vega used to be Lena Valarion's dragon, and it is now being claimed by Amond. To the outrage of Lena's children, Bela and Raina Targaryen, Raina had hoped to claim Vega for herself. She wanted to claim her mother's dragon, but that that birthright was taken from her by Amond Targaryen. So anyway, well, welcome to the live stream. This was a huge episode. Uh, we're going to talk all about it. We're going to answer your questions. We are not going to spoil anything for future episodes, except for at the very end of the live stream. We will have a quick glance at the on the next episode preview. But um, otherwise, we're going to avoid spoilers. We're going to answer your questions. Thanks for joining in. Um, and thank you for the live streams. Jess says, Laris's relationship with Alicent is like if Littlefinger was more open to Catelyn about how just creep, how creepy and conniving he was. Yeah. So we got some interesting scenes with Laris and Alicent. Um, Laris was staring at Alicent throughout the funeral and Kristen even said, like, hey, Alicent, like, your, your, your dude is staring at you. This, this guy is being weird. And Alicent's like, yeah, I know he does that. Like, that, that was kind of the vibe. And then Laris came up later towards the end of the episode and told Alicent, that, like, hey, like, if you ever need anyone murdered, I'm your guy. Um, like, Laris said, oh, you know, I, I heard that uh, you wanted uh, Lucerus's eye. Uh, you know, I, c I can do that for you. I've got an eye guy. I know a guy for that. If you want me to mutilate some children, I'll do it. So, Alicent has that card to play up her sleeve. And yeah, I agree, Jess, with your comparison to Littlefinger. Um, because Littlefinger in, in the Game of Thrones show and in the books has this whole, like, weird, creepy obsession with Catelyn Stark and with Catelyn's daughter, uh, Sansa. Um, and like... Laris, Littlefinger, is someone who uses spies and who uses murder and who uses manipulation. Um, and a big part of Littlefinger's motivation is that he was rejected by Catelyn as a child. Um, I mean, he, he tried to fight Brandon Stark for the hand of um, Catelyn Stark, and that did not end well for him. He got cut opened from, from his belly button to his collarbone, and he always had a chip on his shoulder about that. And he wanted to sort of punish the world for, you know, belittling him and and rejecting him. And so, you know, and Littlefinger is like a small dude who's not very physically strong, which is similar to Laris being sort of physically weak with his club foot and stuff. Um, so I think in a big way, like Littlefinger is trying to get back at everyone and trying to prove himself worthy and trying to win the affections of the woman that he is like creepily obsessed with. So with Littlefinger, that's Sansa. Um, and it seems that with Laris, it's more about uh, Alicent with him. So yeah, there, there, there is definitely some parallels there. I think there's still a lot more mystery with what Laris's game is though. Like to what extent is Laris like genuinely motivated by an obsession with Alicent and to what extent is Laris just trying to get power for himself so I, you know I think and you know there's still the whole sort of mystery of like how does Laris know what he knows like is there some possibility of some magical angles with him I think Laris is still very mysterious but yeah I do think Littlefinger is a good comparison 
Um, thanks for the super chat from Leah, who says, call back to when Aya and Joff were fighting and King Robert had to figure that out. Yes. So we had this scene, like after the children fought, we had this scene where Viserys uh, ineffectually attempted to make some justice. Um, and that is similar to in Game of Thrones season one, episode two, when there was that fight between Arya and Joffrey. Um, when Joffrey was being a dickhead and he, like, attacked Arya's friend Micah. And so Arya pulled, pulled Joffrey's sword and used a direwolf and, like, beat the prince into submission. And, so, and then afterwards we had this scene um, where Robert was like, well, hell, seven hells, what am I to do about this? You know, my family is fighting amongst themselves. Um, and Cersei, I believe, like demanded Arya, Arya's hand to be cut off because she attacked uh, Joffrey. Maybe that's only in the books. Um, but, you know, in a very similar way, you know, Alicent in this episode demanded the mutilation of uh, Rhaenyra's son, Lucerys Valerion, because of the fight. Um, and... You know, in the same way that Robert in Game of Thrones just failed to make any kind of real justice or any real kind of amends, Viserys completely failed. Like, like Viserys at one point was like, well, okay, like, I guess you guys, I, I, I guess there's been a, a fight and I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to declare this done. Even though no one was satisfied by the outcome, no one felt like justice was done. And that's why Alicent picked up the dagger and tried to make her own justice. Um, so this shows us how like Viserys's complete lack of authority, his like complete lack of strength means that everyone else like fills that power vacuum and tries to make their own justice in their own bloody, <laughs> horrible way. So, uh, yeah, definitely a very similar scene. Uh, thanks for the super, super chat from Carnifex, who says that Lenor gets a happy ending. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm pretty happy about uh, Lenor and Carl making the excellent decision to leave before the shit hits the fan. Although one of the, the details, you know, like um, what happened was that Lenor and Carl faked the death of Lenor. Um, but, but they did, they, they did uh, kill someone because like what they did was they threw a corpse into the fireplace um, at Driftmark to make it look like that was Lenor's body so that everyone thinks Lenor is dead so that he's free to run off to the east and just hang out with his boy. Um, but I wonder whose corpse is in the fireplace. <laughs> Someone died. Like, they, they, I mean, I don't know, maybe they got the corpse from a morgue or something. <laughs> Does Driftmark have a morgue? Maybe they got one of the corpses from the bottom of the sea where the Valarions throw all of their dead corpses. Here's a theory for you. Here's here's a really horrifying theory. What if the corpse that Lenor and Carl used to fake Lenor's death, what if this corpse is Lena Valarion's corpse? What if he used his own dead sister's corpse to fake his own death? <laughs> If you want to get really morbid and horrible, because it's just there. It's there. It's fresh. Yeah, no, I no, they didn't do that. They would have used like a male body. And I think the feet were mostly unburned. So I don't know. Maybe it would have had to have been a Valarion. Like it would have had to have been the corpse of someone who looks like Lenor. Am I crazy? Uh, Bubba was taken in the live chat says it was the guy Daemon killed. The guard Daemon knocked down. OK, yes. OK, you guys are right. You guys are correct. It must have been the person who Daemon killed. Yeah, all right. I was enjoying my fan theory, but I'm, yes, I'm sure you guys are right. They used the, the guard that Daemon killed on the stairs, Wh which, you know, I, I feel like is kind of, yeah, this guy. That, that must be the guy who they used in the fireplace. I feel like it's more morally interesting if, um, I feel like it's more morally interesting if Lenor and Carl actually did murder someone in order to escape to their life of freedom. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Shane, who says, exhausting, hiding behind the cloak of your own righteousness. Yeah, so that was Rainier's dialogue to Alicent in that confrontation, um, where uh, Rainier was sort of enjoying Alicent attacking her because Rainier was saying that, like, this reveals how Alicent has it out for her. Like, Alicent is always acting like she's just doing the right thing. She's the one who's following the rules. Um, but now 
Alicent reveals to the world that Rhaenyra has a grudge against Rhaenyra and is willing to mutilate children to do it. And they talked in the inside the episode about how Alicent is always so, like, emotionally repressed. Like, Alicent is always acting proper. She's never revealing her true feelings. And now her emotion just, like, bursts out in, like, this crazy, violent moment. Um, So, no one's even hiding it anymore. Like, up until now- like, everyone's sort of pretending that they're all getting along, but this is sort of the moment when it's very clear that, like, there are sides now. You're either on Rhaenyra's side or you're on Alicent's side. Um, and they, like, they stand in those sides at this moment. The Valerions supporting Rhaenyra um, and the Hightowers supporting Alicent and her children. So, um, my God. Uh, we've got some discussion of sea smoke in the live chat. Because, yeah, there's a bit of dragon claiming shenanigans going on. So, Amond has claimed Vega because Lena Valarion died. And now Lenor Valarion has died as well. And he has a dragon called Sea Smoke. So, now that Lenor is dead, uh, Sea Smoke is up for grabs. Someone, someone will get this um, handsome dragon. Um, I wonder who could claim it. I mean, I, I guess the the one person who could claim it is Raina Targaryen, right? Um, Raina Targaryen is the one of Daemon and Lena's kids who don't have dragons. Bela has her own young dragon called Morning. Uh, no, called uh, Moondancer, who we haven't seen yet. So I guess Raina might claim Sea Smoke. That would make sense. We'll see what happens there. But there are several dragons. Like, like, like Vermithor and Silverwing are the old dragons of King Jaehaerys, the old King Jaehaerys and Alysanne. Uh, and they're hanging around on, on Dragonstone or on King's Landing. There's a bunch of little hatchlings and stuff around. Um, there's potentially like a whole bunch of dragons that are that are um, that could be claimed. I mean, in the books with Amond. Um, King Viserys says to Aemon, like, hey, like, you know, while we're on Driftmark for Lena's funeral, um, or Lenor's funeral in the books, uh, Viserys is like, hey, like, Aemon, like, if you're brave enough, maybe you can claim a dragon at Dragonstone on our way back. You can grab a dragon egg or to grab a hatchling. Um, and Aemon was like, you know, fuck that. I don't want a little hatchling. I don't want a little egg. I'm going to take the biggest weapon of war in the world. Um... And so, you know, and I enjoyed Amon's like ego trip after he he rides this massive creature. And I really enjoyed the dragon riding sequence up, you know, being battered by seagulls and barely clinging on. It was a very sort of fun fantasy moment. But but I enjoyed when, you know, Amon came back from his flight and, you know, this kid who had been bullied and who felt looked down upon suddenly has this rush of power like this child experiences control over the most powerful force in the world so it feels very believable that he would have this crazy power rush and would feel vindictive against you know people who you know after he had felt bullied and so he starts bashing people with rocks i mean it's horrible psychotic behavior but it sort of makes sense with what we know of amond i thought it was crazy how like these kids they're, they're, they're like throwing punches and stuff in this brawl between Rhaenyra's sons and, and Aegon's sons and Baylor and Rhaena. Um, like they were really throwing like punches around. And that sort of makes sense because like, you know, we we saw these kids training in the yard, you know, like these children have been trained to fight. So, you know, they're capable of doing more damage to each other than they otherwise would. Um, so, you know, all of this violence, it's the consequences of the training that these children have been given. Like, they dressed them up in opposing colors, green for Aegon and Aemond and black and red for Jace and Luke. And so, when you pit these kids against each other, it's it's not a surprising outcome um, when they turn against each other. Uh, some people in the live chat are suggesting that Rhaenyra was also in on Lenor and... Carl escaping. Yeah, okay. The con- okay. <laughs> the consensus is that it was Rhaenyra's idea to let Lenor go alive. And that's why they were talking about, like, ruling through terror and, like, seeming to be... Yeah, okay. You guys have convinced me. It was Rhaenyra's plan to let Lenor go. Grant him this kindness. Set him free. Yeah, okay. You guys are right. Lenor and... Rhaenyra and Daemon were planning to let them go free. Yeah, okay. Anyway, let's move on. Um, 
Thanks for the super chat from Unidan, who says, Laris Strong channeling the dude. You want an eye? I can get you an eye, dude. Thanks for the super chat from John, who says, 99% sure that Helena is a dreamer. Yeah, we got a little bit of more strange dialogue from Helena Targaryen in this episode. So, Helena is the daughter of... King Viserys and Alicent Hightower. And in the previous episode, we saw Helena saying some weird stuff about uh, a millipede um, and the number of legs that it has. And then Helena also said, Amond will have to close an eye. Um, and so they were talking about like Amond wanting to claim a dragon. And, Am- and Helena was suggesting that to get a dragon, Amond will have to close an eye. And indeed, in this episode, uh, Amond loses an eye that's cut out from him, but he also gets a dragon. And then Amond later says, well, I lost an eye, but I got the biggest, most powerful dragon in the world. So it's a fair trade. So Helena maybe saw the future. Like, Helena somehow had a dream, a, dra- a Targaryen dragon dream, maybe, that Aemon would lose an eye but get a dragon. So, um, yeah, I think it's pretty much confirmed that Helena can see the future. She doesn't, you know, I mean, she might not fully understand her visions. Like, Targaryen dragon dreams are often metaphorical. It's hard to interpret them. They're, like, symbolic. So, you know, Helena might not be able to, like, warn Aemon that, hey, someone's going to cut your eye out. But, like, her words might give us some insight into what might happen in the future. Um, And so, in this episode, Helena says, Hand turns loom, spool of green, spool of black, dragons of flesh, dragons of thread. So, I think that, you know, I I, I think that that is a symbolic description of the royal family. Um, Like, I think that she's talking about the bloodline. Like when she talks about a loom, like a loom is a machine that makes cloth and fabric by weaving together threads, just like the royal family weaves together the bloodlines of different people into like a fabric of like time and history and family, threads of red, threads of green, like Targaryens and Hightowers intermarrying, creating the the, the fabric of the royal family. So I, I think this particular line is not necessarily a prediction of the future. It's just a sort of a symbolic description of the royal family. And it fits with like the bloodline stuff. Um, so I think that's lovely dialogue. Some people in the live chat are talking about how um, Lenor shaves his head to hide his uh, Valyrian silver hair to like hide that he's Lenor uh, Valerion so that he can escape. Um, And there is a potential similarity there to Varys, because Varys, um, some people theorize that Varys might be a Targaryen or a Valyrian or something. I mean, he is from Lys, and like Lys, like people in Lys do have Valyrian features a lot of the time. Um, But some people do theorize, because like in the books, there's all this stuff about the black fires, and it seems as though there's a connection between like Illyrio and Varys. And this kid, young Griff, it, it, it's a whole thing. But uh, yeah, it is a cool theory in the books that Varys might actually be a secret Targaryen or a secret Blackfire or a secret Valyrian of some flavor. And he might uh, shave his head to hide that particular fact. Thanks for the super chat from Dopey Dragon, who says the Lenor twist not only makes the blacks look less bad for no reason, but also makes no sense. What will happen to Sea Smoke? I don't, know, I don't know if it doesn't make sense. I, I think it, you know, if Rhaenyra and Daemon decided to, you know, free Lenor and Carl and let them get away, I, that that does make Rhaenyra and Daemon look like good guys compared to Alicent looking like a bad guy because she, you know, tried to cut out a child's eye this episode. Um, so, you know, I don't think it, I, I think it's fine. It's, um, it, but it does make Rhaenyra... Um, and Daemon look good while it makes Alison look bad in this episode. Thanks for the super chat from Benson, who says, I'm going to bed, Emma. Yeah. Um, so Viserys mistakenly called his wife Alison by the name of his previous wife, Emma, which is uh, dark. It's, it's a downer. It looks like Viserys is starting to lose his marbles a bit bit of dementia setting in, even though he's only meant to be like, like 30 or, or even less than 30. He looks really old because of his disease. Um, but Viserys is not an old man. Uh, he just seems to be aging before his time under the weight of uh, his disease and his responsibilities. 
I, I kind of enjoyed uh, Damon's performance throughout these scenes where, like, everyone around Damon is, like, sad and unsettled um, and and turbulent with all of these grudges and ambitions. And Damon's like, yeah, I've been like this the whole time. Like, you know, when Damon was leaning against the wall at this scene with um, Alicent and Rhaenyra attacking each other, like... Like, I think Daemon was quietly enjoying himself watching all of the conflict because Daemon has always felt conflicted and Daemon has always felt grudges and Daemon has always felt like he ha- he doesn't have what he's deserved. Um, so I think Daemon, Daemon quietly enjoying that was a nice addition. Thanks for the... Oh, you're- yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, Viserys is not 30. He's- he is like 50. That does make sense because he would because Damon was uh, sorry. Viserys was not yet 30 when he married Alicent. So now it's been like 10 years later. So, yeah, he I think Viserys is like 40 now. Maybe he's like 40. I mean, we could figure it out. Like if we go to uh, check that when Viserys was born. I mean, do we really need to know exactly how old he is? I think he's like 40. Um, I mean, we don't know what we don't know exactly what year it is in Hot D right now. And Hot D doesn't necessarily follow the chronology of these things. Um, yeah, anyway. Thanks for the super chat from Tambuli, who says, Kristen Cole didn't train the bastards as much as he trained Allison's boys. Yeah, so, I mean, Harwin Strong last episode said... Um, that you're not training Jason Luke as well as you're training um, the other kids. Um, uh, his, his, the whole thing with Kristen training the kids and being a dick about it reminded me of uh, Alyssa Thorne. Remember in Game of Thrones when Alyssa Thorne was like the cruel uh, teacher who trained the Night's Watch people and Alyssa like played favorites and he was really cruel to Sam Tarly uh, when he was training the Night's Watch kids. And I think that... Kristen Cole was similar when he was, like, clearly showing favoritism towards Aegon and Aemon. So, yeah, like, maybe that's a good point. Maybe that's part of why um, Aemon managed to beat Jace and Luke and the girls. It's because he was, like, trained better. Thanks for the super chat from Jess, who says, you Targaryens and your weird customs. Yeah, that's true. So, Alicent previously... uh, was like acting disgusted at the prospect of Rhaenyra and Daemon hooking up because it's incestuous. But we learn in this episode that uh, Aegon and Helena are now betrothed to marry each other. Uh, Aegon being the firstborn child of Viserys and Alicent and Helena being Aegon's sister. Um, So Alicent was being weird before about Targaryen incest, but now she's getting her own children to participate in Targaryen incest. Thanks for the super chat from Big Daddy, who says, I'm surprised Crispy Cole didn't jump at the opportunity to take the kid's eye. Yeah, it's interesting that Kristen Cole was one of the more uh, peaceful and relaxed people in this confrontation. Uh, like, he did not immediately obey Alicent when Alicent told him, hey, I want you to cut out Luke's eye. Uh, and that stands in contrast to when Kristen Cole, you know, beat Joffrey Vo- Joffrey Lonmouth to death when he talked about Kristen's secret. So, Kristen maybe has learned a little bit of restraint. I mean, it's a bit like the restraint that Kristen showed with Harwin. Um, so, like, you know, when in the previous episode, Kristen goaded Harwin into attacking him... But Kristen didn't fight back. Kristen just allowed Harwin to beat the crap out of him, which takes some self-control, given that Harwin is the strongest man in the Seven Kingdoms, and Kristen just allows him to wail on him without resisting. Um, So maybe, you know, I mean, it's been 10 years. Maybe Kristen has learned a little bit of self-control and learned a little bit of restraint. Um, Because, yeah, I mean, Kristen cutting out... Luke's eye is something that he probably wouldn't get away with. I mean, people say, people complain about, like, it's crazy that Kristen got away with murdering Joffrey Lonmouth at Lenor's wedding. Um, I think it would be even less acceptable for Kristen Cole to cut out the, the second in the line or third in line to the throne. Um, I don't think Kristen would get away with mutilating Luke in front of everyone. 
because Luke is much more, you know, highborn and much more important than uh, Joffrey Lonmouth was. Thanks for the super chat from Grizzly, who says, how can anyone claim sea smoke if Lenor is still alive? That's an interesting point, because like in the books, uh, Lenor is really dead, as far as we know. I I mean, one of the themes of the book Fire and Blood is that the history books don't know everything and the history books make mistakes. So, you know, I think it I think it nicely fits in the sort of unreliable narrator theme of Fire and Blood that um, people people might not be aware that Lenor actually secretly escaped. Uh, But the thing about dragons is that dragons only bond with one human for their entire lifetime, you know? Um, So, like, Vagar can have multiple different riders. He can have Visenya and then Balon and then Lena and now Amond. But you can't have multiple living Targaryens bonded to the same dragon at the same time. So, you know, if it is like this whole magical thing, you'd think that since Lenor is still secretly alive, um, maybe Amond should... Sorry. Since Lenor is still alive and still Sea Smoke was uh, Lenor's dragon, maybe Sea Smoke can't bond to anyone new because Lenor is still alive. So that so that raises the question of like, is there some like psychic connection that transcends distance where like Sea Smoke magically knows that Lenor is still alive out there somewhere? And therefore, no one can bond with Sea Smoke. Or maybe, as far as Sea Smoke knows, Lenor really is dead, so someone can bond with Sea Smoke. Yeah, I think that's a good and interesting question. And it also, you know, it raises the point that Lenor abandoned his dragon. You know, like shaving off his Valyrian silver hair. He's not only giving up the appearance of being Valyrian, he's giving up his dragon, Sea Smoke. Or maybe um, Sea Smoke will follow Lenor, you know? Like, maybe... Sea Smoke will seek Lenor out and will find it by some kind of dragon magical Targaryen tracking GPS, you know. Maybe that bond um, is too strong for Lenor to leave, willingly or otherwise. Um, it, you know, it, uh, that's one of the things that we're learning more about from this show. Like, in the books, we don't know a whole lot about how the Targaryen dragon connection works. Like, we see a bit of it with Daenerys and her dragons, but Daenerys is still working out how to deal with her dragons like Daenerys is not in good control of her dragons in the main books and then in Fire and Blood like the maesters don't know how how the connection works either so um so yeah it's cool that we're learning more about these mysteries and there are a lot of open questions still uh thanks for the super chat from Nick who says Daemon and Rhaenyra talk fire but show Laenor real kindness yeah, that is that's an interesting difference, isn't it? Um, like I, I thought it was interesting how Rhaenyra and Daemon they were talking about how like fire is dangerous, fire consumes, um, fire is this dangerous thing. But then they decide to get married to each other, uh, so they embrace the d- the destructive Targaryen fire, despite how dangerous Targaryen fire is. Like they talk in the inside the episode about how there is this real dangerous chemistry between Daemon and Rhaenyra. Like, by embracing each other, I think they are embracing the most sort of chaotic, destructive sides of themselves. And they talk about how Rhaenyra marrying Daemon helps to legitimize Rhaenyra um, because it combines Rhaenyra's claim with Daemon's claim. Like, remember, like, in episode one, Daemon was considered, or at least Daemon considered himself, to be the heir to the throne because he was the brother of the king Viserys. Um, So now, when Daemon marries Rhaenyra, that sort of combines Daemon's claim with Rhaenyra's. So it sort of makes Rhaenyra more of a legitimate um, heir to the throne, arguably. But we also need to remember that in episode one, a lot of people didn't want Daemon on the throne. And a lot of people were worried that, you know, Daemon would rule through Rhaenyra even. So, like, the fact that Daemon married Rhaenyra, in some ways, it makes Rhaenyra a better heir and a stronger, more legitimate heir, but it also might make people not want to support Rhaenyra because Daemon is there. Like, Otto was saying, like, we cannot let Daemon be king, we cannot let Daemon... Uh, have influence. So, some people might be less likely to support Rainier now. Thanks for the super chat from Lucy the Gamer, who says, Lenor was awesome and Amond finally got a dragon. Thanks for the super chat from Mick, who says, I can't imagine what the kids must think as the only guests of Rainier and Amond 
at Damon their wedding. I don't know what you're saying there. Uh, Sick says Adam Valerion is Lenor. Oh, uh, well, we're not going to spoil anything in the future, but that's that's an, that's an interesting wild theory. Thanks for the super chat from Dark Aurora. Thanks for the super chat from Shane, who says Daemon and Rhaenyra were trifling for smashing at Driftmark. It seems like a bad idea to have sex with your uncle on a beach after <laughs> after the wedding, uh, as uh, as Rhaenyra and Daemon did. Did did you guys like the? Uh, intimacy between Daemon and Rhaenyra. I-, I thought it was quite creepy because, you know, Rhaenyra was was the one who initiated it. Rhaenyra was saying that, you know, I have needs and I want you. Uh, practicing a lot of affirmative consent here. Well done, guys. Um, but I thought it was very creepy given the context and like the history with Rhaenyra and Daemon because Daemon is Rhaenyra's uncle. And Daemon has done this, like, creepy, intimate thing uh, with Rhaenyra ever since she was a child. Um, He was very sort of close to her and giving her gifts. The word grooming has been thrown around. Um, And then Daemon took his young niece to a sex club and made out with her and only stopped because he sort of found himself unable, whether physically or morally. It's a little ambiguous. But, you know... And, you know, that's how Rhaenyra discovered her sexuality was by macking on her uncle. So, you know, I guess from that perspective, it makes sense. You know, she's been trapped in this uh, sexless marriage with Lenor while banging Harwin on the side. But, you know, I, it makes sense that Rhaenyra is attracted to Daemon. Um, but I think that it's icky <laughs> because it's her uncle who knew her since she was a kid. Yeah, I guess this is not a uh, this is not a controversial opinion I'm expressing here. <laughs> I'm not breaking new ground by saying this is icky. But uh, yeah, it's also icky with all of the sand that is in all of their crevices right now. Uh, like they just put their clothes back on and just went back. Anyway, let, let's move on from the incest. Thanks for the super chat from Coconut, who says, "Why wasn't a, it a big deal that Amond took Vega? It is a big deal that Amond took Vega for sure. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, they should have talked about it at this confrontation scene. Yeah, I agree with you, Coconut. I always agree with a coconut. Um, yeah, they should have, like, they were really angry about Amon losing an eye, but they also should have been really angry about, hey, guys, this child just took the biggest weapon of war in the world. This is kind of a big deal. I, th- I think that's an issue throughout the show. Like, I think that they should be talking more about what valuable critical assets these dragons are and who owns them is an entirely big deal. And I feel like they should be talking about Vermithor and Silverwing. Like, I've put them on this chart because they are two of the biggest, oldest, strongest dragons in the world. And, like, who controls them is a big deal. And especially now that, like, the battle lines are being drawn, I think that everyone should be really thinking about who controls these powerful weapons uh, as the conflict gets worse, because I think it's very clear right now that this conflict is getting worse, not better, and there's only going to be more violence between these two sides. So, yeah, I, I agree with you, Coconut. I think the ownership of Vega should be a big deal. And and I think, you know, they raised some interesting questions in this scene um, where Raina and Baylor were saying, like, hey, we have a right to this dragon because that was our mother's dragon. So, Amon should not be allowed to take Vega. Um, But Amond is like, well, you know, Vega was up for grabs. Lena was dead and and Amond rejected the idea that Baylor and Rena have some special ownership. And that's another thing that, you know, it's not really clear in the books, like who gets access to which dragons. Like some of the dragons are on Dragonstone. Some of the dragons are in the dragon pit. Vega was apparently just like hanging out on the beach, just like just like retired um, until Lena and then Amond took her out of retirement. So. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, legitimate open questions about, like, who gets dragons and who controls dragons. And so, uh, yeah, I I hope that they'll talk about that more in the future. Um, Thanks for the super chat from Mineth, who says they aren't trying to make Amon Blood Raven, right? (laughs) Yeah, so so there is a character uh, in the books called Blood Raven. um, And Blood Raven is born years and years, generations after um, this whole story in House of the Dragon. Um, And, you know, Bloodraven originally did have two eyes. So, um, so no, Aemond Targaryen is not Bloodraven. Uh, But Bloodraven is this extremely cool character uh, in the Duncan Egg 
uh, prequels and then Blood Raven later becomes uh, the three-eyed raven or the three-eyed crow who teaches Bran about magic. And yeah, like Blood Raven is, is missing an eye because the eye was cut out by Bittersteel, who was Blood Raven's half-brother. Um, and they got into a bit of a spat over um, who got to hook up with their mutual half-sister, Shiera Seastar. Uh, so it was this whole it was this whole other Targaryen civil war that was also largely about incest and, and stuff. But this is like long after the dragons were gone. This is this is later. So so no, Bloodraven is not Amond, but Bloodraven is a very cool character. Thanks for the super chat from Sod, who says Viserys was born 77 AC. Uh, Lena died 120 AC, so Viserys Targaryen is 43. Yeah, okay, thanks for the clarification. We, we don't know exactly what year it is in um, House of the Dragon. Like, they're switching around the orders of events. I mean, yeah, well, this is the year of the Red Spring. So, you know, I guess it should be 120 AC. The year of the Red Spring is, is the year that everything goes terribly wrong. It's the year that Aemond loses his eye, Lena Valarion dies, Elaenor Valarion dies, Harwin Strong and Lionel Strong die. That's the year of the, the Red Spring. And yeah, it's when everything starts to go dramatically downhill. Um, we already talked about Lenor's dragon, uh, Sea Smoke. And yeah, it's possible that someone could now claim Lenor's dragon, Sea Smoke. Or maybe since Lenor is still alive, maybe Sea Smoke will go and follow Lenor to the east. Or maybe Sea Smoke will not bond with anyone else. Uh, it's an open question. Thanks for the super chat from CC, uh, Team Crabs, T- Team Celtigar. Sends their regards. I have to admit that when this show was announced, I was disappointed, but I could not have been more wrong. Love the new wedding tradition. Yeah, so they did this whole, like, ancient Valyrian blood ceremony in the marriage of Daemon and Rhaenyra. And I enjoyed this. Like, I really enjoy, like, one of the things that they're emphasizing in this show is that uh, Daemon and- is that the Targaryens- are very connected to their Valyrian heritage, especially uh, Daemon is like very enthusiastic about it. He's like a LARPer, big, big history buff who loves his uh, genealogy in a a creepy amount. Because like, remember, like the Valyrians were horrible. Like the Valyrians were a slave empire who like conquered half the world um, in their in their hunger for, for slaves until they blew up. Um, the Valyrians were, like, not great, and yet, uh, Viserys has his whole little Warhammer, uh, model railway, uh, diorama of how much he- he loves Valyria, and Daemon wants to emulate the Valyrians, like he was talking earlier about polygamy and stuff, like the Valyrians, like our Valyrian forebears. And they say in the books that all Valyrian sorcery is based on blood or fire. Um, and so in this wedding, we, we see both. We see that there's blood on the candles or maybe they're just red candles. I hope those are just red candles because that's a lot of blood. Um, but, you know, Rain- but Daemon and Rhaenyra, they both cut themselves with dragon glass or obsidian, which is the um, which is the volcanic stone that can um, that can kill white walkers. And so, I th- yeah, I think it is very appropriate that the Valyrians use dragon glass to cut themselves to make a blood bond. And it makes this marriage between uh, Rhaenyra and Daemon feel very real and very significant. Um, so, yeah, it's almost like this is Rhaenyra's real marriage, you know? Like the Lenor thing was not all that meaningful to her. It did not produce children. They weren't really, you know, romantically in love. This, this bond between Daemon and Rhaenyra is like the real magical lifelong type thing. Um, Mineth, thanks for the super chat. Yeah, we, we just discussed um, Aemond and Bloodraven. <laughs> Aemond and Bloodraven are not the same character. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Atri, who says, I like how nobody other than Otto cares that Amond claimed Vega. Yeah, it's silly. It, it should be a big deal that Amond claimed Vega, especially now that war seems to be approaching. Thanks for the super chat from Dustin, who says, it seems to me that Lenor and Carl escaping together was the plan. Yeah, I think it was Rhaenyra and Daemon's plan to let Lenor and Carl escape. Uh, I thought at first that maybe Rhaenyra genuinely wanted Lenor dead, but uh, it looks like she actually allowed her husband to escape to freedom. Thanks for the super chat from James, who says, So Lenor Valerion was the last son alive? 
Yeah. So, Rhaenys Targaryen and Corlys Velaryon had two kids, Lena and Lenor. Lena died trying to give birth, and Lenor has now seemingly died, um, killed seemingly by his lover, Carl. Um, and so, it's been a pretty bad year for Rhaenys and Corlys, losing both of their children uh, in short succession. And I enjoyed this scene between Corlys and Rhaenys. Um, before the death of Lenor, where they're discussing Corliss's ambition. And Rainey says basically the same thing that she said um, previously when she was saying, hey, Corliss, like, I don't care about the throne. I don't want the throne. I'm over it. Um, but Corliss is like, I want a Valerion on the throne. He wants his grandchildren, Jace and Luke, uh, to inherit the throne, even though he knows that they are not really his children by blood. Because uh, they're actually Harwin's children, not Lenor's children. But Corliss has this nice line about how history does not remember blood, it remembers names. Which is true. Like, it's true in real history. Like, some people, there are lots of real historical figures where we don't know for sure who banged who. But we do know their name, and we do know their accomplishments, and we do know their history. So, you know, you can leave a legacy you can, y- your name can be passed on even if you aren't actually connected by blood. Um, so, we have this moment between Corlys and um, Lucerus Valerion, because the idea is that Rhaenyra's firstborn son, Jace, will inherit the throne after Rhaenyra, whereas her second son, Lucerus, will inherit Driftmark and High Tide. He, he will be the new lord of House Valerion. And Corlys embraces that, even though Luke is not his child. They look nothing alike, but but Corlys is willing to embrace that. And I think that is why uh, Daemon chuckled during his wife's funeral, which was like, oh my god, Daemon, you dickhead. Because, like, Vaemond is making this speech about our blood must never thin. And then Daemon chuckles, which is, like, the most disrespectful thing to do. At your own wife's funeral. Fucking hell. Um, But he laughs, and I think he laughs because the the Valerion blood has been thinned. It's been thinned in the sense that Jace and Luke, the supposed children of Lainor Valerion, are actually the children of Harwin Strong. So, in that sense, the Valerian blood of House Valerion has been watered down by introducing Harwin. Because the whole idea is that the Targaryens and presumably the Valerions, they mostly marry within their own family to preserve their Valyrian dragon riding blood. They don't want other families to get their dragon riding genes, and they don't want any other family's non-dragon riding genes getting into their own bloodline. So, so you know, by accepting Luc- Lucerus Valerion as his heir, Corlys is, like, allowing his family's blood to be watered down. But, but I guess, like, in the case of the Valerions, the Valerions are not dragon riders. Like, Lena and Lenor Valerion are dragon riders because they are the children of Rhaenys Targaryen, because the Targaryens have dragon riding blood, but the Valerions don't. So, like, I guess that might be why Corlys is cool with it. But, like, you know, surely Corlys would want to preserve Lena and Lenor's blood because they are dragon riders. So, if Corlys wants his family to have dragons, he should not be supporting Jace and Luke, or Luke being his heir. He should be supporting Baylor being his heir, because that's what Rhaenys says in this scene. Rhaenys says that, like, hey, I don't want you to make... Lucerus Valarion heir to Driftmark. I want you to make Baylor Targaryen heir to Driftmark uh, because Baylor is actually our blood. Baylor is actually uh, Corlys and Rhaenys's grandchild, unlike Luke. Um, so Rhaenys is supporting the candidate who actually is a dragon rider. I feel like they should be talking about this stuff. Like, I guess maybe it feels like icky to talk about, like, you know. <laughs> gene selection uh, and such, but um, yeah, it is very significant. Like, who will inherit Driftmark and will that person be a dragon rider or not? Will that person be of Corlys Valarion's blood or just of his name? All interesting questions. Um, the last of the Valarions. Yeah, that's a good point, Galadorn, in the live chat. Since, I mean, by blood... You know, Jace and Luke have the Valerion name, but not the Valerion blood. Um, I'm, well, I mean, you say the last of the Valerions. Vaemond Valerion is still alive. 
Um, and Vaymond in this episode was very conspicuously wearing uh, some very fancy Valerion regalia. Uh, Vaymond was giving the speech, and and he's very conspicuously wearing the Valerion crest. So, so, so no, like Bela and Reyna aren't the last Valerions. I think uh, I think Vaymond is positioning himself as the last Valerion. And since it's it's since it's Vaymond specifically talking about the importance of Valerion blood and not watering it down, I think Vaymond is positioning himself as saying like, hey. I've got pure Valerion blood, so uh, we will see how that develops. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Goat, who says, Did Rhaenyra and Daemon get married right after Lenor supposedly died? Yes, which is considered a party foul. Um, they, they talk in the books about how everybody's outraged that uh, Daemon and Rhaenyra marry right after both of their respective spouses died. Daemon's wife, Lena, just died. Rhaenyra's husband, Lenor, just died. And yet these guys are instantly getting married. And, the, and you know, they didn't ask anyone's permission to get married. Like, you're meant to have the king's blessing if you're going to marry royal people like this. Um, so this is just their own thing. By the way, I, I, I like that this Valyrian priest guy has this, like, glyph on his chest. I don't know what that glyph is meant to represent specifically. I guess it's something Valyrian, but like, I enjoy that they've got their own thing going on here. Like, who is this guy? Like, is he a priest of some Valyrian religion? Like, in the books, they talk about the Valyrians worshipping many different gods. Uh, the the names, um, you know, Meraxes and Cyrax, those are the names of Valyrian gods. So, like, there is a, like, Valyrian religion or multiple Valyrian religions. I wonder if this guy is a priest of some Valyrian religion alongside the religion of the faith of the seven and the faith of the old gods. It's um, it's cool to see this stuff. Like, this is the kind of sort of magical world building cultural lore that the books are full of, but the original Game of Thrones show did not show much of this stuff. And I really like how House of the Dragon is embracing that, that world building and that magic and all that good nerdy stuff that makes the books so much fun. Uh, people in the live chat are asking, what happened to Mazaria? Yeah, so Mazaria was the former lover of Daemon, um, and Viserys ordered uh, Viserys ordered Daemon to get rid of her. Um, and we saw that the relationship between Mazaria and Daemon seems to have broken down in episode four. Like, Mazaria gives Daemon a place to crash, but Mazaria also, like, tells Otto through her spies um, that Daemon hooked up with Rhaenyra. So it seems that Mizaria might have actually been working against Daemon in episode four. Um, and Mizaria has now established herself as, yeah, like a spy master working for Otto. So I, you know, it's been 10 years since then. So we don't know what Mizaria is up to now. Maybe she's become even more powerful in the intervening years. Or maybe she's decided to, you know, leave, <laughs> maybe go back east. <laughs> Uh, considering how bloody things are getting in Westeros, uh, it might be a good idea to do what <laughs> Lainor and Carl did. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if Mazaria returns and what her relationship to Daemon and to Otto might be. Uh, Christian in a Super Chat says, where is Daeron Targaryen? Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but... Um, uh, I, I mean, I will note that in the opening sequence to the show for the past couple of episodes, um, there have been four uh, rivers of blood coming from Alicent Hightower, not three. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's a spoiler. Like, like at this point, uh, Alicent and Viserys actually have four children, probably. Like, they haven't confirmed it yet officially, um, but see how there are four blood streams coming from Alicent. <laughs> I I feel like this opening sequence is not very good, if I'm being honest. Like, it's meant to be a symbolic representation of the children, but, like, y you can't tell who's who. Like, most people can't easily tell who's who on this symbolic tree. But there are four blood streams suggesting that there are four children um, of Alicent and Viserys. And so I think what's happening is that that fourth child... Uh, Daeron Targaryen might be fostered in Old Town currently and we might see him later because they've never said yeah they've never confirmed either way so I think we'll see Daeron later so uh, there will probably be an additional child 
added alongside Aegon, Helena, and Amond a bit later on. Um, thanks for the super chat from Mara, who says, Otto is a terrible person and grandfather. He's causing the conflict. Yeah, I thought that scene was a lot of fun when, like, Alicent attacks Princess Rhaenyra. Um, and then her dad comes in and says, like, yo, it, it, remi- it reminds me of the bit when uh, Daenerys comes home in Game of Thrones season six. Like, remember when, like, Daenerys, like, went off into the Dothraki Sea um, and uh, and then Tyrion and, like, Dario and, and Grey Worm were left to sort of hold the fort. And then everything went catastrophically wrong. And then in season six, episode eight, like Daenerys said, like, hey, kids, I'm home. Like, what happened in the meantime? And then Tyrion has to explain that, yeah, that like, yeah, everything, everything went horrifically wrong. Um, sorry, Daenerys. Um, I, I, I got a similar vibe when Otto walked in uh, and Alicent was like, oh, yeah, sorry, dad. Sorry, I attacked the princess. I, I I did wrong. I'll I'll, I'll go on time out. Um, but Otto, contrary to Alicent's expectations, was actually quite proud of Alicent. Like he was actually smiling when he said, "Oh, I've never seen that side of you before, Alicent. Uh, you know, you clearly have the determination to win this game." Look at him smiling. His daughter just attacked the princess and demanded a child have his eye cut out and Otto is smiling. So yeah, like I agree Mara that Otto is a pretty horrible dude. He is encouraging this conflict to get worse. Otto is not interested in peace. He wants this conflict. And so I think that, you know, that that clarifies, you know, like when Otto was talking to Alicent in episode five, um, Otto was saying like, Conflict is inevitable, like war will follow. If Rhaenyra takes the throne, Rhaenyra will try to kill your children. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. Maybe that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like Otto was saying that, oh, there will inevitably be conflict. But maybe the conflict is only happening because Otto and people like Otto are are causing the conflict to happen. And then, you know, Alicent passed this message down to her son Aegon and said, like, hey, Aegon, there will be conflict. Rhaenyra will try to kill you. But like... That, that only is true because Alicent a- and others are making this conflict worse. So, yeah, I-, I think you can make the argument that Otto and Alicent and others are largely responsible for making this conflict happen because, you know, they're, they're encouraging it. They're embracing it. Otto is uh, not a great guy. Um, everyone in the live chat is saying hashtag why Matt? Thanks, Mineth. And I don't know why. Uh, are we talking about Matt Smith? Matt Damon, as he's known. Anyway, uh, thanks for the super chat from A. Latinu, who says, How does Kristen Cole crush Joffrey Lonmouth's head in, but the strongest knight, Harwin Strong, barely phases him? Yeah, I mean, I don't love it when people punch people in the head multiple times and there's no lasting damage. Like, one of the worst was in the Battle of the Bastards in the original Game of Thrones show, when Jon Snow punched Ramsay in the face, like, I think it was like 30 times or something. Um, I think if you did that, your hand would be broken, all your fingers would be broken, and the other person would be dead. Uh, and in, in the previous episode, Harwin came and punched Kristen in the head about a dozen times. Uh, well, maybe just like six. I don't know. I didn't count. But Harwin is supposed to be the strongest man alive. I mean, I guess, you know, I'd, uh, maybe Harwin was not punching him as hard as he possibly could because, yeah, then Kristen would be dead. Um, but, yeah, I agree. It's kind of dumb. Um, I mean, Cri- yeah, Kristen should probably have some pretty serious head injuries. Maybe he does. Maybe Kristen did s- sustain some brain injuries in that beating, and maybe that explains Kristen making uh, poor decisions now and in the future. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Kate, who says, Do you think Alicent is supposed to be hotter? Um, yeah, Alicent is described as being hot, but I don't know. Seems kind of rude to speculate on real human beings attractiveness thanks for the super chat from mick who says i can't imagine what the children think at daemon and rainier's wedding yeah that's true so uh, at the wedding of daemon and rainier uh <laughs> rainier's sons jace and luke and the uh, cousins bela and Raina, were just sort of watching this blood magic ritual and yeah this this face facial expression is exactly
exactly how I was feeling too. Um, watching them like share blood because they, they they cut their body on their lips and on their hands and then they like smushed their open wounds together like I don't think that is COVID safe guys uh, that was gross and weird and the kids are uh, yeah looking appropriately disturbed um, thanks for the super chat from Blastwave who says love the channel Nate and Katie says hi thanks for the super chat from Dev who says the child fight was mad uncomfy. Yeah, I mean, we talked about how that... I mean, that feels like the natural result of all of the training and all of the all of the words that were said by the parents. Like, they were telling each other, you should be enemies and here's how to fight. So, it's, like, not surprising that this happened, really. Um, <laughs> hashtag blame the parents. Uh, yeah, we talked about uh, Rhaenyra and Daemon. Thanks, Alchemist. Thanks for the super chat from Nick, who says, Rhaenyra is also a dragon of three heads, three false sons, three lovers, three betrayals. The symmetry between her and Daenerys is unreal and tragic. Yeah, I mean, George uses a lot of the same tropes and a lot of the same ideas in his Westeros stories. Yeah, there certainly are parallels between Rhaenyra and Daenerys. Like, I mean, both of them are people who try to claim what is rightfully theirs, i.e. the Iron Throne, and they feel like a lot of people are against them and a lot of people are against them and people betray them. Um, and they sometimes indulge in violence that they really shouldn't because they are Targaryen dragon riders who have that sort of fiery energy and sometimes they lash out. But um, I thought Rhaenyra was relatively quite restrained. I mean, I think in this episode it was more Alicent who was lashing out violently while Rhaenyra was the one who was composed, you know? Like Rhaenyra, when Alicent was attacking her with that Valyrian blade, Rhaenyra was just saying, well, now they see how you really are. Um, she was holding back. And I thought, you know, I mean, it is a change from the books that they use this Valyrian steel cat's paw dagger. Uh, that's the one that Alicent attacks Rhaenyra with. Um, and in the show, uh, this cat's paw dagger is the one that Arya uses to kill the Night King and end the Long Night. And in the show, Aegon has in engraved the prophecy of the Song of Ice and Fire about the White Walkers onto the blade itself. So, like, the blade, as Viserra says, is a symbol of the importance of the Targaryens being unified and strong in order to save the world from the White Walkers. So it's it's wonderfully, you know, it's a wonderful juxtaposition that this dagger that is meant to symbolize, you know, unity and the sacred responsibility of um, the Targaryens is instead used for division and infighting. And I love that the dagger drops to the ground. As though, you know, like Alicent drops the dagger to the ground as though this responsibility is being dropped. The Targaryens are failing to uphold their sacred responsibility to be unified and to try and save the world from the White Walkers. I thought it was interesting that it was then Kristen Cole who picked up the dagger. Um, this, this this magic prophetic cat's paw blade is picked up by Kristen Cole. Maybe that's meaningless. But um, why is he the guy with the dagger? Maybe it's going to be significant who has it. Like, I would think that Kristen would give it back to Viserys, surely, because it's because it's Viserys' dagger. But I wonder who will take up the dagger next. I mean, maybe Rhaenyra will take up the dagger because she's the one who knows about the prophecy and, you know, Viserys passed it on to her. But, yeah, it's kind of weird to me that Kristen has it. Probably not a big deal. Anyway, um, thanks for the super chat from Mineth, who is asking Matt why for some reason. Thanks for... The super chat from Mutt, who says, any significance to the Valyrian steel knife having no blood? Yeah, that 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 is true. Like 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 we did see in uh in this shot, we see when Alicent drops the knife, there's no blood on the knife, even though Alicent just slashed Rhaenyra's wrist with the blade. I don't know, maybe maybe Valyrian steel is uh moisture wicking and it simply <laughs> rolls right off. <laughs> I I don't know. There are, um, I like how you can see sort of like the folds and like the, the waviness in the texture of the blade. Um, apparently that's like a real world kind of steel called Damascus steel, which is a special ancient kind of steel that is extra strong and light because Valyrian steel is extra strong and light and 
uh, is better for making weapons with. But the secret of making Valyrian steel is now lost. No one knows how the Valyrians made the Valyrian steel. Um, there are some fellas like Tobo Mott who know how to reforge the steel, and that's how Viserys, uh, sorry, that's how Tywin Lannister melts down ice and turns it into Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale. Um, but no one knows how to make new Valyrian steel. So there's about like 200 known Valyrian steel blades in Westeros currently in the time of the main series, but no one knows how to make more. So they are these very precious artifacts. Thanks for the super chat from Kevin, who says, I was hoping Carl would actually kill Lenor, and then Daemon would ride Caraxes and set fire to Carl's ship to wrap it up. I feel like a fire from a dragon is one of the more conspicuous ways to murder Carl. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's basically how it sounds in the book. Like, in the books, it is a mystery what happened with Carl and Lenor. Everyone thinks that Carl killed Lenor. Um, but it is suggested that maybe Daemon paid Carl to kill Lenor because Daemon wanted to marry Rhaenyra. Which, again, in itself is a little bit different because in this episode, it is Rhaenyra who initiates sex with Daemon and it is Rhaenyra who proposes marriage to Daemon. Um, it's interesting, like, Daemon has become more passive. Daemon has, like, sort of, like, he, he's more sort of standing back. Like, in previous episodes, Daemon was always trying to bring attention to himself. Like, he, like I love the scene when Daemon, like, walks in with the crown of the stepstones and Daemon is trying to say, everyone look at me. Like, he had that whole tantrum in Dragonstone where he, like, stole the dragon egg and he declared that he was marrying Mazaria. And it, it, was, it was just a tantrum. Look at me. Look at me. And then he, like, you know, si he, he risks his life to single-handedly kill the crab feeder. And then he takes the crown and gives the hammer and drops it on the ground. Add it to the others. Daemon is just screaming for attention before the 10-year time skip. But now, like, maybe, you know, maybe in a way, Lena Valerion, his wife, did change Daemon a bit. Like, maybe she did mellow him out. Maybe, you know, and, and I don't think that'll last. Like, wh what I think is that Daemon marrying Rhaenyra might be a return to fiery Targaryen chaotic behavior. Like, the, the fire and blood uniting with Rhaenyra. I think they will make each other more dangerous, more violent, more chaotic. Whereas for the last couple of episodes, Daemon has been relatively reserved and has been allowing other people to be um, crazy and violent. Yeah, he became a dad. Maybe becoming a dad, you know, mellows him out. Maybe. <laughs> hey, look at me. I'm Mr. Daemon. Um, thanks for the super chat from Harold, who says that episode seven says that Rhaenyra is good and Alicent is bad. Yeah, I, I agree that that's how it comes off. Like, Alicent, I think, comes off as clearly a villain here because she attacked Rhaenyra with a dagger and she tried to cut out Luke's eye, which is, like, that, that is Cersei behavior. She was behaving like Cersei in Game of Thrones episode two. So, Alicent, I think, does come off as, as a monster here. I, I mean, I, you know, I mean, in her defense, Alicent has just seen her own child have her eye cut out. And I think many parents would react intensely <laughs> uh, in response to their child being mutilated. Like, I, I think you would get very emotional and angry uh, if your child had their eye cut out with a dagger. Uh, I personally have gotten very upset in the occasions when my children have had their eyes cut out. So I can relate to Alicent here. Um, but yeah, I, I do agree that Alicent comes off as more villainous than Rhaenyra here. Um, and so one of the sort of constant questions here, one of the constant things to think about is like, are we siding with Rhaenyra or are we, are we siding with Alicent? Who is the hero? Who is the villain? And, you know, it is meant to be a morally complicated story, but sometimes some person will seem bad or some, sometimes someone will see, will see bad. Um, anyway, thanks for the super chat from Kevin and thanks for the super chat from I am Lavum, uh, who sides with Alicent. Otto is a G. I feel like Alicent got worried about Strong because he seems to be a loose cannon. What do you think? Uh, well, there are no Strongs alive anymore, unless you count Jason, Luke, and Joffrey. I think you mean that Alicent was worried about Kristen. Not sure what you mean. Thanks for the super chat from Default, who says, Kind of disappointed with the lack of Valyrian dragon lore. 
besides the wedding this episode. Yeah, I, I would like to see more discussion of the dragons. I mean, look, we, we got to see Amon, Amon claim Vega. Like, that was extremely cool. I like the sort of communication almost between Amon and Vega. And I loved how Vega looked. I mean, it, it was very dark, like like a lot of these bloody TV shows. You need to you need to <laughs> turn up your brightness in order to be able to see what's going on in these dark scenes. But I think Vagar's like appearance was wonderful, and I loved how Vagar was clearly just this, you know, old grandma just having a nap on the beach. And Vagar is sad that Lena died. Like in the books, they mention. Um, Oh, yeah, Lara Strong. Yeah, I'm sorry. We'll get back to that. But I like how they mention in the books that, you know, Vega is upset because uh, his writer, Lena, has just died. Like, Vega is in mourning. You know, Vega uh, had to put up with the death of Balon, had to put up with the death of Visenya, and now Vega has lost another writer. So, in the books, they say that Vega is especially grumpy. Um, and Vega's grumpiness makes it dangerous for Amont to come and try and claim her. Um, and when Vega got angry at being woken up, like any grandma would, uh, Vega, like, even, you know, got ready to breathe fire on Amond, like, her, she was charging up her lasers, but then Amond stood firm, and just like Chris Pratt in Jurassic World uses the hand, holds up his hand, like Crocodile Dundee, to say, no, don't kill me. And used Valyrian commands and then Vega accepted Amond. And Vega was also like sniffing at Amond. Like we saw Vega like like getting a good getting a good whiff of Amond. And I and I think that that might be Vega smelling the Targaryen genes in Amond and going like, yeah, okay, like you pass the sniff test, therefore you can claim me. You are a real Targaryen of Valyrian blood. And because uh, yeah, like a dragon would not allow a non-Targaryen or someone without Targaryen dragon riding blood to claim them. So I enjoyed that. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I am Lavam was talking about uh, Lara Strong being a loose cannon. Yeah. So, I mean, in the previous episode, Alicent was horrified that Lara Strong killed his father, Lionel, and his brother, Harwin. Um, uh, she was like, I did not wish for you to murder Harwin and Lionel. Um, so I, I agree that Alicent is a bit scared of Laris and you've got Laris like sort of leering at Alicent from across the funeral, which is just so awkward and, and weird. Um, but I think Alicent also recognizes that Laris is useful because Laris was saying that like, hey, like I can get shit done. Like you need an eye. I've got an eye guy. Like I can accomplish shit. And like, I think Alicent is scared of what Laris might be capable of. But, you know, especially after being encouraged by Otto earlier, I think Alicent is starting to accept that, like, this is going to be a violent, bad situation. So having a violent, bad dude like Laris at her side seems useful. And, you know, I, I think that by using Laris, Alicent is playing with fire. And I think that she understands that on some level. But um, I think she knows that she might have to use him. She says that, you know, I need someone who can uh, use d discretion. So, um... Yeah, thanks for the super chat from Mustang, who says, You're my favorite YouTuber, and your videos help me sleep. I feel like the pacing was weird, but the ending made my jaw drop this episode. Thanks, Mustang. Um, yeah, the pacing- Well, yeah, I, I agree the pacing did feel a bit weird, because, like, there was a lot of everyone just standing around looking at each other significantly. Like, there was a lot of sort of- funeral standing around and then there was a lot of like post funeral standing around and then you know like there was a lot of sort of like slow conversational moments and then it was like whoa ch children fight uh m mutilation dragon ride and then back to the slow brooding thing so yeah I, I, that, that might feel a bit weird the pacing Th uh, thanks for the super chat from Bifong who says what are your thoughts on the general vibes doing the potential of the story justice I think they are doing the story justice, yeah. I mean, you got to remember that the book Fire and Blood is very uh, short. Like, th like, this entire season of TV so far has taken place within one chapter in the Fire and Blood book. The Fire and Blood book doesn't have any detail. It doesn't have any dialogue or almost no dialogue. It's just like, on this year, this happened. And on this year, that happened. So, you know, given the, the bare bones that they have, I think that they've done a fantastic job of, like, adding some flesh and bones to that skeleton. And, you know, they've made some interesting choices, like, you know, letting Lenor and Carl escape and live free. 
But um, I think that that's a good decision. I, I think, you know, some people might dislike that particular change. Um, but I think it's interesting because, like, this, the, the book is about, like, the historians don't know everything. Weird stuff happens that, that the historians don't find out about. And I think this is the sort of difference that there is. I mean, also, like, Lena Valerion's death last episode, like, her choosing to die by dragon was, I think, like, a cool and interesting change. And that's better and more interesting than just Lena dying in childbirth or dying after childbirth, as she did in the books. I mean, I think one change that is disappointing is that in the in the books, Lena and Daemon were on Driftmark for some time with their kids, Baylor and Raina, and uh, Rhaenyra was on Dragonstone. And so Rhaenyra became close friends with Lena Valarion and with Daemon, and they used to ride their dragons together and their kids got to hang out. Um, so there was these like years of closeness between Rhaenyra's family and Daemon's family in the books that we didn't get in the show. And I think that's a shame. So some people even ship Rhaenyra and Lena um, because it's said in the books that Rhaenyra is fond and more than fond of Lena. And some people got some sort of like um, vibes that Rhaenyra may have had a crush on Alicent when they were kids. When they were teenagers under the Weirwood tree, they were quite intimate. So some people reckoned that Rhaenyra might be bisexual. There's no, you know, there's not a lot of proof either way in Fire and Blood. But um, yeah, it's a shame that we didn't. I mean, just in general, it would have been good to see more of Lena Valarion. She's she's an important character, um, but we, we don't get to learn much about her apart from her sort of brief moments in the previous episode. Thanks for the super chat from Daniel, who says, do you consider the expansions in the show to be actual changes or more so explanations of vague events. Yeah, I mean, look, there's no official absolute canon. Like, like you know, like George Martin said in a recent interview with History of Westeros, and you should all go and check out the History of Westeros YouTube channel and podcast, which is one of the great uh, Song of Ice and Fire content creators. But they got to interview George, and George said, like, when... Aziz and Ashaya were questioning George about issues of canon and what is real and what is what is true and what is false. And George said, like, hey, guys, like, I make this shit up. Like, there's no official canon. Like, the, the, all they're doing is telling good stories. Um, so I don't think we should worry too much about, you know, is this a retcon? Is this official? Is this historical inaccuracy? It's like, yeah, those are all themes, but I don't think there's any one true real truth of what happened because uh spoiler it didn't actually happen thanks for the super chat from boy brushed blue who says the shot of rainiera zoning out during the during the bumping bits scene looks similar to alicent and viserys in bed that is an interesting interpretation um i personally did not notice rainiera zoning out i'll have to rewatch it i i mostly was just um cringing at the thought of all the sand that they were boning on um i thought it i thought i thought we were meant to read that scene as like some real genuine intimacy that they were both enjoying i mean they probably wouldn't have gotten married if rainiera had had a bad time during that love making but yeah people's interpretations might vary there um, thanks for the super chat from Andrew Taubman and from the Cat Files, who said, really, I, I wish you spelt files the other way, Cat Files. Really enjoyed the interaction between Rhaenyra and Daemon's kiddos this episode. Hope we see them become closer next week. Yeah, there was this little moment where Rhaenyra came up to Jace and was like, hey, you should go and be nice to Baylor and Rhaena because they just lost their mother and they are your cousins and so you should be good to Baylor and Raina. Uh, and so they had a little moment where Jace went over and, and held held their hands, held Baylor or Raina's hand. Um, and, you know, we talked in the previous video about how Baylor and Raina, it's not sort of clear what their place in this world is because they grew up in Pentos. Like Damon said that Pentos is our home. Um, so it's like, you know, will Baylor and Raina fit in on Driftmark? Will they stay on Driftmark? What's their deal? Who are these kids? Um, it seems as though they were close with Rainey's Targaryen, their grandma. Um, so maybe they do know each other. Maybe they have spent some time together. It's not really clear what their deal is, but it'll be interesting to find out. 
Thanks for the super chat from Judith, who says, is Laris in love with Alicent? Yeah, he has, he has this sort of hungry look to him. Like, he looks like he wants Alicent, for sure. But, like, does he want her romantically? Does he want her sexually? Or does he just want her politically? Like, I think it's very clear that Laris is trying to manipulate Alicent. Like, in the previous episode, he was very much saying that, like, you owe me, you know? Um... So, I I think that Laris wants Alicent for political advantage as much or more as he wants her romantically. But that could be part of it as well. I mean, look, Laris is living in a world where men like him tend to be valued for their physical prowess. And Laris was the brother, the little brother of Harwin Breakbones Strong, one of the most celebrated knights in Westeros, the strongest, handsomest dude who was so hot that he could, you know, (laughs) he could convince the princess and the heir of the realm to cheat with him. Like, that's how, like, hot and successful Harwin was. So, perhaps Laris felt resentful and left out and, and, you know, maybe he's an angry incel. Maybe he's, like, angry that he feels rejected. And so, maybe that's part of what's going on with him. Uh, you know, with his club foot and stuff. Maybe he was teased for that. Maybe he feels like Amond. Like, Amond was bullied and feels, like, punched down on. And so, when he gets Vega, he's on this power trip and he's really excited to have power and he wants to sort of punish the people who made fun of him. Like, there's a sense of that from Amond, I think, this episode. So, maybe Laris has, like, a similar vibe. He wants power to sort of show everyone that he's good and tough, even though he's got a wonky leg. Um, Which, again, I think, yeah, that is quite similar to... uh, uh, it's quite similar to Littlefinger. Blue Milks feels bad for Rhaenys. Yeah. Yeah. There's a line in the books about how uh, Corlys and Rhaenys, like, you know, like the year of a red spring was a bad year for everyone, for a lot of people. Um, and everyone had reason to tear their clothes and to mourn and to be upset. But no one had more reason to be upset than Rhaenys and Corlys because they lost both of their children in one year. So, it's a dark day. Thanks for the super chat from Isis, who says, Since Vega is quite old, don't you think she might die pretty soon? Yeah, I mean, dragons can die of old age, because Beleriand the Black Dread died shortly after King Viserys claimed Beleriand. Like, Viserys rode Beleriand, like, once or twice, and then Beleriand died because Beleriand was hundreds of years old, going back to Valyria, like centuries old. Uh, and Vagar is Vagar is now like 170 years old or something. Uh, we have her actual birthday in the book, which is nice. If you want to celebrate Vagar's birthday, you can get a little dragon birthday cake, maybe a goat with a candle on its head. That would be an appropriate birthday cake for a dragon. So, yeah, like, Vega might... I mean, I mean, they do say in the books that Vega is slowing down. Like, she's very sleepy and slow compared to how she used to be. But she is still powerful when she gets angry. Um, ju- just like many grandmas. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe Vega will die soon. Certainly she's slowing down. Maybe she'll start forgetting people's names, a little bit like Viserys, mistakenly called Alicent by Emma's name. Maybe... I mean, maybe Vega is, uh, you know, starting to get some dragon dementia. Maybe Vega thinks that Amond is Visenya or is or is Balon. I saw a funny meme about like it's a meme with like someone taking their grandma out of the retirement home, and it's like, oh, is that you, Visenya? Are we conquering Dawn again? Like she's this sort of doddery old lady. Um, Vega is wonderful, uh, and I hope that she doesn't die soon. Thanks for the super chat from Nick. And well, yeah, to talk a little bit more about dragons, like uh, dragons, they talk in the books about how the older a dragon gets, the bigger it gets and the tougher it gets. Um, Like the scales of a dragon harden as the dragon gets older. And so uh, an old adult dragon can't even be pierced by, like, arrows and scorpion bolts and stuff. Like, the, those scales are, like, almost impossible to, to break. Um, one, one of the only things that can kill an adult dragon is another adult dragon. Like, we saw that in the reign of Magor. Uh, King Magor the Cruel killed his nephew, Aegon the Uncrowned, and his dragon Quicksilver with uh, Beleriand. So, dragons can kill dragons. 
Um, and dragons are very tough in their older age, and I think their fires grow stronger as well, so, yeah. Um, Jess in the live chat says Meraxes was quite young then. Yeah, well, Meraxes is an exception, because Meraxes was the dragon of uh, Rhaenys Targaryen, who was the sister wife of Aegon the Conqueror, and Meraxes died in Dawn, because the Dornish uh, shot a scorpion bolt into Meraxes' eye, so that was that sort of, like, you know, freak chance thing that it managed to hit Meraxi's eye specifically. So it bypassed all of Meraxi's tough scales and just went right into a little dragon brain. So uh, that can happen too. Look, it's Game of Thrones. No one is safe. Anything can happen. Um, yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Nick, who says, No matter what you think about Amond, you have to give him credit for having the biggest balls in Westeros. Yeah, Amond, Amond stood firm, even when the biggest monster in the world was, like, threatening to burn him. Um, I like how Vagar has, like, these ropes all over Vagar's body, which is, like, rigging. Because, like, how else could you attach saddles and luggage and people without some rigging? Uh, Amond almost fell off Vagar while, while he was going on the joyride. Uh, Amond forgot to uh, connect himself to Vega by a chain, which I think is how it's usually done. You don't want to fall off a dragon when you're flying around like that. The, the whole dragon flight sequence was, was really fun. Like, I like how it felt dangerous and, and wild and, you know, it's all very, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel at all realistic the way that, you know, he's like clicking on when he's being flung around. But, you know, it's a dragon. It's a dragon flight. I feel like this dragon flight was more fun than the dragon flights in Game of Thrones. Like, we got some with Daenerys and even with Jon, but um, th- this one had a lot of sort of dynamism to it. Some, like, fun angles and, like, swooping over the water and, like, the birds. And I, I really liked how Vega looked like he was above the clouds um, earlier during the funeral. Just, like, this shadow on the clouds. was. I, I, I thought there was a lot of interesting dragon cinematography going on in this show, which we uh, didn't get so much of in the original show. Um, It was also cool just seeing the sheer number of dragons that arrived on Driftmark. That's one, two, three, four, five in that shot alone. In the books, they say that there were so many dragons on Driftmark that it was like Driftmark had become a second Valyria, um, which is, you know... That speaks to Targaryen power that they have so many dragons, but it also is a bit ominous because Valyria fell. Valyria was destroyed in the doom. So like being like Valyria is not necessarily a good thing. And I think that's part of why, you know, this Valyrian model city is like one of the central symbols in this show, Um, because the Targaryens are so obsessed with their history, like, you know, Daemon and, and Rha- Rhaenyra have this Valyrian wedding, but over all of these constant, like, connections to Valyria is looming the fall of Valyria and the inevitability of, of death and failure and collapse. So I think we should be uh, mindful of those themes when we're looking at all of these dragons on Driftmark. Thanks for the super chat from Elijah, who says, Amond seemed like his nephews, and Aegon, outside the bullying, seemed mostly fine too. Did they not care that their nephews were bastards? Yeah, I I mean, like, Aegon is very lax. Like, Aegon doesn't really seem to care about anything. He's not very enthusiastic about the prospect of marrying his sister Helena. He just sort of wants to drink and flirt with serving girls. And, you know, I think, you know, like, he's kind of a dick, um, but he's not, like, super harmful, but he's being pushed into violence anyway. You know what I mean? Like, it might be better if Aegon was allowed to just drink and just be dumb rather than pushing him into, you know, a potential conflict. Like, it's the tragedy of all of these kids being forced into conflict. Thanks for the super chat from Tambali. We will talk about the next episode preview later. Thanks for the super chat from Atri. Yeah, so we discussed before that Helena says this thing about like the loom uh, weaves spools of black thread and black thread and green thread together, dragons of flesh and dragons of thread. And I think that that's talking about bloodlines, family trees, 
weddings, marriages, all like interconnecting people into a fabric of the royal family, like a tapestry. It's like a metaphor for the interconnectedness of the family. Dragons of flesh meaning the Targaryens and their family and their intermarriages. Green being Hightower and red being Targaryen. Thanks for the super chat from Stuart who says they are going fast. They are going to do five season. We might get to the Blackfire stuff. Uh, Well, they're they're telling the story of this time period and this conflict uh, with Rhaenyra and Alicent. And they have talked about potentially covering other time periods after this current story, um, if this current story goes well. Like, they talked about House of the Dragon could become, like, an anthology, kind of like The Crown, where they tell different stories in different time periods. Um, But the plan currently, as I understand it, is just to cover this particular conflict and this particular time period right now. We talked about Laenor and Sea Smoke. Um, Maybe someone else will claim Sea Smoke, maybe not, because Laenor is still alive. We answered that one. Um, thanks for the super chat from Mineth, hashtag Laris, and from Boybrushed, and from JD, who says, I, Are we going to ignore the fact that Daemon and Rhaenyra murdered a man to get married? Yeah, so I, I think what happened is that Rhaenyra and Daemon deliberately let Laenor and Carl get away. Um, like we saw Daemon on Driftmark killing that guy. But as, as you say, JD, they did murder this guy. <laughs> Like, they murdered this random servant guy and burned him in a fireplace to be, like, the decoy corpse so everyone thinks Lainor is dead. So, yeah, like, I was saying before that, you know, letting Lainor and Carl go free makes it look like Rhaenyra and Daemon are good guys. But they did still murder this innocent man. <laughs> so, so, so we can't get to, we, we can't praise Daemon and Rhaenyra too much. They did murder this guy. So, so they are not the only... Alicent is not the only person who was villainous this episode. Uh, uh, Rainier and Daemon did murder an innocent person. Uh, thanks for the super chat from R, who says, The Maester says Valyrian steel cuts clean when he's patching Rainier up. Maybe that's why there's no blood on the dagger uh, when when Rain- when Alicent cuts Rainier. Yeah, maybe. I, I was pretty worried for Rainier back then. Um that 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 was like that was a cut in Rhaenyra's wrist that Alicent made with that dagger. Um, if if that was me, I would not be as calm as Rhaenyra was about that deep cut in her arm. I I, I think there's some I think there's some blood vessels in there, guys. But uh, she seems pretty relaxed about it, and then she goes on to cut herself more for the wedding with Daemon. So there's a lot of blood flying around this episode. And the book, of course, is named. Fire and blood. Uh, thanks for the super chat from live performances from Jeshu, who says Rainy Rainy Targaryen looks like Kristen Bale. Christian Bale, interesting take. Thanks for the super chat from Ashley, who says that Rhaenyra used Alicent's rage on purpose. She's leaning into the rumors now. She saw a chance to gain the higher moral ground, and she took it. Yeah. Yeah, Rhaenyra was absolutely, like, using Alicent's attack as a way of showing everyone that, like, hey, look, Alicent is a murderous maniac and I'm the good guy. That that definitely is what was going on there. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Jared, who says, Reading A Feast for Crows for the first time, and wow, are there some hot D spoilers in there. Yeah, I mean, it, like, when George wrote the Game of Thrones books and when the original Game of Thrones show was made... They didn't know that there was going to be a TV show about this time period and this conflict. So in the books and in uh, the original Game of Thrones show, uh, there is some stuff about like what happens at the end of this conflict. Um, You know, you can look at it on YouTube. There's a scene where Joffrey says some things about what happens in this conflict. So, uh, so yeah, you can search that out if you want. But um, yeah, there are there are there are spoilers out there, but we're not going to discuss spoilers here. Thanks for the super chat from Tambuli, who says the person who Alicent should be upset with is her dad. He tossed her into the dragon's den. Yeah, like, Alicent has just sort of gone along with Otto for the longest time. Like, she has obeyed him. Like, it was Otto who pushed Alicent to marry King Viserys in the first place. And it was Otto who told Alicent that there will be conflict with Rhaenyra and Rhaenyra's children. Um, And I I feel like Alicent should 
start to push back against her father. Like, especially after this 10-year gap, like, Otto has been away for such a long time and Alicent has started to assert her own power. You know, when she walked in with a green dress and she called Rainier a stepdaughter and she was really sort of being more confident in her own power. And also, you know, like, Alicent is increasingly overriding Viserys and asserting her power, so... It's interesting that, but, you know, as soon as her dad comes home, she just turns into a little girl again, you know, like she just instantly regresses to being under his influence. And so I wonder if that will continue or if there'll be a moment when Alicent is like, hey, wait a minute, I'm in some deep shit, partly because I was listening to Otto when I shouldn't have been. Like, I'm, I'm not a kid anymore. I, sh- I don't have to do what my dad says. I'm the queen of the seven kingdoms. So I wonder, like, how their relationship will develop. Um, I mean, I, I think that as this conflict gets worse and worse, I think there's going to be moments when the characters have moments of clarity and go like, oh, no, like, <laughs> I, I, have, I have made a series of poor decisions. Thanks for the super chat from Mineth, who says, uh, so your kid had their eye cut out? Oh, yeah, happen, happens all the time. Happen, you, you, I mean, eyes are just popping out ev- every which way at all my family gatherings. Thanks for the super chat from Narvini, who says, would you like to see Vagon Targaryen in the show? Vagon the Dragonless? Archmaester Vagon? So, yeah, like, the Vagon was one of the children of uh, Jaehaerys and Alysanne, who was uh, considered briefly to maybe potentially be the king of Westeros, but they decided not to because he's a nerd and no one likes him, and he doesn't like anyone in return. Um, I I don't think Vagon needed to be in this show. Um, I mean, he could have been, like, an extra at the Council of Harrenhal flashback, but, you know, this show wasn't really about that era. I mean, it it could have been. Um, I, I believe that George Martin, in an interview, was... Or or Ryan Condal said that, you know, George was pushing for this show to start earlier, back in time. Um, Like, they really could have spent a bit more time with Jaehaerys' reign and Jaehaerys' children. Uh, Because, you know, there was this whole previous succession dispute where some people were saying that Rhaenys should take the throne or Rhaenys' son, Laenor, should be the heir to the throne. Um, And... The show just sort of gave us the cliff notes of that in this little flashback sequence at the start of episode one. But they certainly could have spent more time there. Um, So if it is that House of the Dragon ends up um, covering other time periods, yeah, maybe they could cover the reign of Jaehaerys and Alysanne. That that could be interesting. Um, Where are all those other Targaryens, Stretch says in the live chat. Yeah, I mean... Is, uh, I, I, I suppose bloody Sarah is dead now, but like, yeah, Jaehaerys and Alysanne had a whole bunch of kids. Like, we know about, uh, Aemon, father of Rhaenys, and Balon, father of Viserys and Daemon, uh, and Alyssa, but like, th- there was like a dozen of them, and that's why in the opening sequence there's this explosion of bloodlines, um, here. These are the children of Jaehaerys and Alysanne, and most of them met tragic ends one way or another. Most of Jaehaerys and Alysanne's children died young, one way or another. Um, but I guess Vaymond, Vaymond lived his days in the Citadel and I suppose died of old age, unless there are any little uh, Targaryen maester bastards running around somewhere. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Biotic, who says, Rhaenyra should have been like, F this, I'll take two husbands. She has no respect for the rules anyway. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, Rhaenyra was telling Daemon that, like, yeah, I can't marry you uh, until Laenor is dead because I can't marry multiple husbands. Um, but, you know, I mean, polygamy has been a thing. Like, Daemon was saying previously that, you know, Aegon took multiple wives, Magor took multiple wives. Why can't I take multiple wives? Aegon and Magor were, like, not that long ago, um, historically speaking. This was Aegon here and Magor here. Um, it wasn't that long ago that Targaryens did have multiple spouses. So maybe Daemon and Rhaenyra could do the same. But I think that, you know, it's important to have legitimacy. Like, they're not just marrying out of romance and love. They're marrying out of a political alliance. And for that political alliance to be respected... It helps if they actually follow the rules of the kingdom that they're in. So, um, I think that's why they were not doing polygamy. Thanks for the super chat from Gensai, who says, How is Kristen still on the King's Guard? He not only kills Joffrey Lonmouth at a feast, but he obeys the consort over the ruling monarch and tries to harm the heir. Uh, he 
didn't obey Alison's order to cut an eye out of Lucerus, if that's what you mean. Um, I think Daemon sort of stopped Kristen. Like Alison says, Sir Kristen, bring me the eye of Lucerus. And Kristen was like, uh, maybe no. You will do no such thing. You're sworn to me, Viserra says. Like, Kristen, Kristen does not attack. Yeah, he says, as your protector. So, Kristen refuses to attack Luke. Um, I, th- I think it is questionable how everyone is chill about the death of John- Joffrey Lonmouth. But um, he didn't obey Alicent. Yeah. Thanks for the super chat from Tambi Lee, who says, No disrespect to Emma Darcy, but I enjoy Millie Alcock more as Rhaenyra. Millie Alcock was the young Rhaenyra. I think Millie displays anger more in her face, and I would like to see more anger being expressed by Emma. Yeah, well, yeah, I I agree that Millie was more expressive as Rhaenyra, which makes sense because, like, she's an angry teenager, whereas Emma Darcy is playing a politician who has, I think, had to learn to be a little bit more restrained um, as a result of, you know, being a politician for so long and having all these secrets that she's had to keep. So I, I think in a lot of ways it makes sense that Rhaenyra is now a bit more constrained, a bit more serious. She's not a teenager anymore. But I agree that, you know, Millie Alcock's performance as young Rhaenyra was very charismatic and fun. Um, so I hope that we'll see a little bit more of that. I mean, maybe in her new marriage to Daemon, Rhaenyra might show a little bit more of her, like, old, fun, rebellious, fiery side. I mean, she said as much when she was like, hey, we Targaryens are fiery. Let's bring that fire together. Let's be fiery together. So maybe we'll see a little bit more personality from Rhaenyra there. But I think at the moment, like, Rhaenyra is under so much pressure because she's terrified that her bastard children will be revealed as bastards. She's terrified that she might be disinherited. That Like, like just as much as Alicent is afraid that her children might be put to the sword, Rhaenyra is going to be afraid that her children could be killed because her her children are a threat to Alicent's children and their claim. So, you know, I think Emma's got a lot to be worried about. Rhaenyra has a lot to be worried about. So I think it makes a lot of sense that she's more restrained. Thanks for the super chat from John, who says, who is your favorite Targaryen in this show? There's a lot of Targaryens to choose from. Uh, I think that Daemon is fun, and I think Matt Smith's performance is fun, and he's got a lot of layers and a lot of fun stuff going on with him. I find Aegon amusing, like Aegon's performance as the sort of, like, teenage drunkard who's just annoyed at everything, and he's a total dickbag um, in, I think, an amusing way. Helena is so mysterious. Baylor and Rayner, like, we haven't seen much of Baylor and Rayner yet. I mean, it was fun to see them pummeling Amont. Uh, and I hope we get to see, you know, Baylor's dragon soon. So, yeah, I, I, I guess Daemon is one of the most fun for me. But, uh, I mean, n- none of the Targaryens are boring. I, I mean, one of the senses that we do get is that, you know, like, someone like Lenor, especially, is is fairly, like, level-headed. Like, the Valerions are more level-headed, whereas it's the Targaryens who are fiery. I, I guess Rhaenys is also quite level-headed. Like, I-, I think it's an interesting dynamic that they've gone with for Corlys and Rhaenys. That, like, Corlys is the one who's agitating for, we need to claim our birthright, we need power, like, I'm willing to fight war for my son, Lainor, and and his children. Whereas Rhaenys, the Targaryen, is chill, and she's the one who's saying, I'm over it. And I wonder if maybe that will change. Like, maybe Rhaenys' personality will change a bit, because, like, you know, she was saying, everything's cool, like, let's not fight. But now that both of her children have died in one year, she might be angry. She might be traumatized. She might She might change her mind about how relaxed she was previously so i would be interested if um rainy's changes uh thanks for the super chat from yogi who says in essos lenor and carl get to have sex all day thanks for the super chat from jd who says do we really think daemon would allow aegon and alicent to live in peace after rainiera ascends the throne even if they don't press their claim I mean, in episode one, we saw Daemon on the Iron Throne. And, you know, partly he was being provocative, but I think partly he was showing his interest in power. And, you know, like Viserys in episode one says that Daemon doesn't really want to be king. He doesn't really want power. Power is too much responsibility. Daemon just wants to be free and do what he wants. But, like, Daemon also has this deep thing 
where he's angry and feels rejected by Viserys that he was not made heir and he was not made hand. And so claiming power is this deep emotional thing for Daemon. Um, and now that he's married Rhaenyra and he has this bond to Rhaenyra, like, yeah, like maybe he will want to help Rhaenyra take the throne. Um, and Rhaenyra does seem to be deeply invested in in defending her claim. And I think that at this point, like, it, it no longer is even about the throne. It's the principle of it. Uh, like, they don't- like, Rhaenyra's side and Alicent's side, they don't want to submit to each other. Like, even- like, I, I mean, would Rhaenyra enjoy being the ruler of the Seven Kingdoms on the throne? Would Alicent enjoy being the mother of King Aegon Targaryen? Maybe not. Like, I, I don't think their lives would be better from being king. Like, I think they all know that having power is just a source of, you know, responsibility and mortal danger and long, boring council meetings. Like, Rhaenyra was not enjoying the council meeting last episode. <laughs> like, she was fiddling with her- with a council ball in the small council meeting last episode. Um, and, you know, Alicent was- was fairly grumpy as well. No- no one has fun being a politician. But I think that they are not willing to back down anymore because it's- it's personal. Blood has been spilled. Their children, um, have been bloodied in this conflict. And so if they back down now, it's like they are betraying their damaged children. They are betraying the- the, the people who died to get them here. Lainor and Lain- well, not Lainor, but Lainor and, like, the bloodied kids. So, uh, I think we're entering a, uh, spiral of violence. Thanks, Zaveko, and thanks, Sod Blitz, who says they made it a point that Kristen was on watch tonight, and the king asked who was on watch, wonder where he was when the fight happened. Yeah, that's an interesting point, because, yeah, like, when Viserys was leaving the funeral, um, and when he called- he called Alicent Emma, um, yeah, you have the Night's Watch, Sir Criston. So, Criston was on watch when Vagar got stolen, and Amond had his eyes slashed out. So, yeah, Criston did not do a great job. And, like, it's funny, because Bela and Raina that night, they woke up, they heard what was going on, and they alerted Jace. So, like, they acted, they noticed, they confronted the issue, but Kristen didn't do shit. So, yeah, I think that's a great point. Kristen's job as Nightwatch was, um, not- not- not very competent. Not doing very well. Uh, Philippe says, I love the scene where everyone is disobeying Viserys. Um, yeah, Viserys was going, silence, silence, listen to me, and most people were not really listening to him and not accepting his justice. And nodding, not accepting his, um, authority. Thanks for the super chat from Zachary, who says the Swifty Squad is eager for more Akok Abridged. There is a podcast called Game of Thrones Abridged by a rapscallion by the name of Alt Swift X. I've never seen the appeal, personally, of Alt Swift X. It just seems like a, uh poor imitation of uh, Alt Shift X, but uh, some people do enjoy that show, and I would not be shocked if there was more episodes of Game of Thrones abridged in the near future. So uh, you can check out Alt Shift X. Alt Shift X is almost on 100,000 subscribers on the Alt Shift X YouTube channel, and I shudder to think uh, what what new content might come from that particular den of depravity and iniquity if uh, Alt Shift X hit 100k subscribers. So, uh, Watch out for Alt Swift X. Thanks for the super chat from Cosmic, who says, Am I the only person who has no idea who was thrown into the fire in place of Lainor? I think it was this serving man who Daemon killed, this fella here. I assume that is who ended up in the fireplace. So, uh, Rhaenyra and Daemon did a good thing, letting Lainor and Carl run free together, but they did a bad thing that they murdered this guy and turned him into a human s'more. Thanks for the super chat from Josh, who says, is this the prettiest or artsy-fartiest episode in the Game of Thrones television canon thus far, visually speaking? I mean, some of it was very dark, visually. <laughs> there was a lot of blurry, dark stuff in this episode. Um, yeah, I guess there was some interesting cinematography, there were some interesting shots, there was- light was being played with in some interesting ways. I- I, I don't- I don't think there are many shots like this in the original Game of Thrones TV show. Um, there's a lot of fire light as well, um, which is always representing, like, anger and rage and emotion. 
Every second scene in this show is lit by fire in the background, especially the Targaryen characters. Whenever they're talking about their feelings, there's fire in the background to show their internal emotional burning fire. So, um, so yeah, I, I do like how it's shot. There are some very pretty shots. This is a very pretty shot. So, yeah, I, I think they're doing a little bit more cinematographically than the Game of Thrones show ever did. Like, yeah, this shot is very lovely as well. So, yeah, I agree with you there. Um, Jozu says, imagine not having a high-end HDR OLED TV. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I I'm sure this show looks great if you have a $3,000 TV that's big. And also if you have, like, a gigabit internet connection that can stream this video at full quality. Like, that's the thing. Like, like they can make this show as pretty as they want. But if most people are watching this show on an unreliable 1080p video stream on a TV or, God forbid, on a laptop that does not have the capability to show all the glorious colors and the HDR and everything, it's kind of pointless, isn't it? If they allowed us to actually download these video files in high quality, we wouldn't have that problem. Problem. That's the problem with video streaming. Video streaming is like it's 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 convenient and it's immediate, but there's a I'm not I'm not the first to to say that there's a lot of problems with the current video streaming landscape and it doesn't work very well for everyone. Um, when it whenever someone like makes an album, after they mix it in the studio and they balance the audio and they get it all perfect. They then, like, put it on a CD and listen to it in their car, on their crappy car speakers. And they do that so that they can hear it the way most people hear it. Most people don't hear content the way it is created in their fancy studio. They hear it on, like, a iPod shuffle or on a Spotify stream. So, like, in the same way, people who make multi-million dollar TV shows, they should make sure that it looks good on a small screen with a crappy internet connection. Because that's how a lot of people are watching this stuff. Uh, despite David Lynch's complaints, that is the reality. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Protapia, who says, My headcanon is that when Alicent cut Rhaenyra, the Valyrian steel dagger became Lightbringer. <laughs> All right, let's, let's do some prophecy talk. Uh, because in the books, there is all sorts of stuff about the the prophecy that the White Walkers will be defeated and Azor Ahai and the prince that was promised. And uh, there's it's a whole thing. Um, and part of the prophecy is this thing called Lightbringer. And Lightbringer is a sword that will be used to defeat the White Walkers, apparently. But there's a lot of speculation about, like, is Lightbringer a literal sword? Is Lightbringer the sword Dawn, the mysterious meteor-forged sword of House Dane? Or is Lightbringer a metaphor for dragons? There's a lot of different um, ideas about what Lightbringer is. And, like, in the TV show, this Valyrian steel catsboard blade was used by Arya to kill the Night King. So this catsboard Valyrian steel dagger did play the role of Lightbringer in the sense that it was the blade that saved the world. Um, and in the books, part of the story of Lightbringer or a story of Lightbringer is that it is forged with the lifeblood of a loving wife. Azor Ahai killed his wife Nissa Nissa and that's what made Lightbringer Lightbringer. So the blade needs blood to be Lightbringer. Um, and, you know, we do see the blade kill some people. Um, I mean, the blade got uh, Catelyn Stark's blood in Game of Thrones episode two uh, when that when that cat spore assassin went after Bran. Um, so it was bloodied with Catelyn's blood. Uh, and then the blade was used to kill Littlefinger uh, in Game of Thrones episode Game of Thrones season seven. Um and then it killed the Night King. So, yeah, I mean, maybe in some sense, Alicent slashing Rhaenyra with that blade was an, was another blood sacrifice that empowered this blade to eventually kill the Night King. Um, I mean, really, you know, I, I don't think that was really quite a sacrifice. Like, you know, Alicent was trying to slash at her enemy. Well, no, well, she accidentally cut Rhaenyra. So I, I don't think that that particular moment quite had the narrative weight to be the sacrifice that makes the Blade Lightbringer. But, you know, I think this is a good and fun and interesting line of questioning. Like, like, are they going to do things with that Blade that make it sort of fit the prophecy? 
Because one of the disappointments of Game of Thrones Season 8 for a lot of people was that the prophecy stuff didn't really make a lot of sense with regards to the book lore. Because Arya Stark is not a Targaryen, and the prophecy says that a Targaryen, or at least the Targaryens think that the prophecy says that a Targaryen will save the world. So, you know, there's lots of ambiguity, and since the show is paying more attention, like, like this show, House of the Dragon is emphasizing the prophecy in ways that the original Game of Thrones show never did. I think it's worth keeping an eye on um, what that's going to be. Um, yeah, and wh- <laughs> and yeah, wh- while we are complaining, I can see some people agreeing in the live chat that um, digital streaming sucks for a lot of people. The uh, The subtitles is something else that I have seen people complain about because the Valyrian subtitles that are hard-coded, like, burned on um, to the House of the Dragon stream on HBO. It's tiny, tiny, tiny little yellow text. And I'm sure when the people in Hollywood are making this show and they're making this show on monitors that are as large as um, my car and they are watching on, they are watching it in 4K and they've got their fancy computers and internet connections. I'm sure those tiny yellow subtitles are very easy to read for them, but a lot of people are watching these on small screens and they can't read this text very easily, especially if their internet is not great and it drops to 720p. So yeah, we can, we can bitch all day about that stuff. Anyway, anyway, yeah, yellow font, why yellow? Anyway, thanks for the super chat from Evan who says, I feel like Viserys ought to exile Alicent and dismiss Otto again. Seems wise. Honestly, it might be good for the kingdom if if Viserys said, you know what? Enough with the High Towers. I've had enough of the High Towers, they're leaving. And I'll just raise Aegon and Aemond and Helena myself. Like maybe that would be better for the kingdom. But I don't think Viserys is, is eager to exile his wife. That, that, that tends not to go down well. Um, might might not be great for their relationship if he exiled his wife. Thanks for the super chat from Kevin, who says, Daemon wearing a hoodie equals trouble. Well, I think this episode is the first time that Daemon wearing a hoodie was doing a good deed. Like, he was he was letting Carl go free with Lenor when he wore, wore a hood. But he did also murder that guy. So well, well, he's not wearing a hood when he does the murder. So that disproves the theory that Daemon is always uh, wearing a hoodie when he's being evil. Th- there was, um, it was funny with uh, Rhea Royce um, when Daemon was wearing this comically large hood. Like, how enormous is that hood? It looks like it was made for Gregor Clegane. That, look, look, look at that thing. That's ridiculous. Daemon's head isn't that large. Why is that hood so enormous? I heard some speculation by Joanna Robinson uh, on a Ringer podcast saying that maybe the reason why Daemon has such a comically enormous hood is that um, they needed a stunt person to do this stunt with this horse. Like, they didn't want to put Matt Smith's pretty face in the way of a horse hoof. So that's a stunt person. And in order to hide the fact that it's a stunt person, Daemon is wearing a gigantic hood to cover his face from the back. That sounds like a good theory to me, and I heard that from um, Joanna Robinson on the Ringerverse podcast, which is also a good show that you should check out. Thanks for the super chat from Sitali, who says, Do you buy that Lenor would agree to abandon his family right after he's he's told Rhaenyra that he's super committed to her? Um, Yeah. Yeah, it c- yeah, because Lenor told Rhaenyra, like, hey, like, I'm ready to take my responsibilities seriously. I'm ready to be a real father to Jason, Luke, and Joff. I'm ready to try to have sex with you, even though I'm not sexually attracted to you. Um, but then, n- next minute, Lenor and Carl just abandoned their families, their homes, their dragons, their birthright, their castle, and just went off to hang out in Essos. Which, yeah, that's a bit of a turn. But I think that, you know, it's very clear that Lenor didn't want to do any of those things. Like, Lenor didn't want to play husband to Lenor. He saw it as a responsibility. And and I guess that, I mean, maybe there should have been a scene or maybe it was sort of implied that there would have been a conversation. Um, maybe there, there should have been a conversation where Ra- Rainier is like, okay, I get it. Like, I, I, re- I release you from that responsibility. Like, I appreciate that you're trying to do the right thing, but you know what? I think it's better for everyone if you just live the life that you actually want to live free with Carl rather than living 
a life with me. But yeah, I agree that it's still crazy that he abandons everything because like, you know, we saw, I, I mean, you know, Lena always wanted to get away. Like last episode, Lena was saying like, I want to go to the Stepstones. I want to have adventure. I want to get sapphires big as chestnuts. So like it is consistent. Like he did want to get away. Um, and it doesn't sound like he had the best relationship with his father, Corliss, given that his father, Corliss, was like <laughs> hoping the whole time that Lena would turn straight. Um, but, you know, but but I guess one of the interesting things, as we have been saying, is, is what about Lenor's dragon, Sea Smoke? Because, like, in the books, it says that Sea Smoke is Lenor's pride and joy. Like, he loves his dragon, Sea Smoke. And we saw him in episode three riding Sea Smoke on the Stepstones and having an enormously fun time. Uh, hashtag, that's what I call pod racing. He was he was loving it flying that dragon, Sea Smoke. Um, and, and the bond with a dragon is like a, is like a sacred thing. So would Lainor want to abandon his dragon like that? Maybe his dragon will follow him. Maybe his dragon will fly east to him. That would be cool. Uh, thanks for the super chat from El, from Jess, who says Viserys' daughter oriented favoritism is showing. You reckon that Viserys sided with Rhaenyra more than he sided with Alicent? I feel like Alicent was... I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, Viserys said, like, what do you want me to do? Like, do you want me to cut out the eye of my grandchild, Luke? Like, do, do you think that will make things better? I, I mean, I, I, maybe what Viserys should have done was said something like, okay, like, you know, Amond and Luke and Jace and maybe Baylor and Rhaena... They did this fight, they caused this violence, so they all shall be punished. Like, they all will be in detention, no dragon lessons for them for the next month, and no cookies and no fortnight, and maybe you should have, like, exiled some of those kids, or, like, sent them away, or, like, done something to punish them in order to do something resembling justice. Because I think, you know, that's the reason why Alicent attacked Luke, or and attacked Rhaenyra, is because... She was not getting any justice from Viserys. There was no consequences, so there was no satisfaction. So I think Viserys should have given some kind of consequences to try to settle things without mutilating any children. Because that's what justice is. <laughs> when we attempt to make justice, we attempt to make everybody happy, and we we hope to give consequences to crimes, hopefully without any children losing any body parts. That always is the hope. That always is the hope. Uh, thanks for the super chat from mine, who says, I think you missed my chat because I had to use the restroom. Uh, yeah, no, we already talked about that one. Um, yeah, a Amond Targaryen is not Blood Raven. They are both missing an eye and they are both very cool characters. But yeah, we talked about that. Uh, Blood Raven comes much later. Thanks for the super chat from Icy Fire and from Peter Flynn, who says, are all 17 to 18 dragons descended from the three that conquered Westeros. Could inbreeding cause their downfall faster than humans? <laughs> yeah, that's a fun idea. Maybe th maybe those dragons have a Habsburg chin from their generations of inbreeding. Because, yeah, like, I mean, we are told that the Targaryens left Valyria uh, with their dragons and with their slaves. The Targaryens had slaves that they brought with them to Dragonstone. Um, and yeah, they, they brought their dragons with them. I, I don't know how many dragons the Targaryens brought with them to Dragonstone. Um, I mean, Beleriand was one of the original dragons that they took with them. Um, I, I don't remember how many they had on Dragonstone. But yeah, they bred and reproduced on Dragonstone. And at the time of Aegon the Conqueror, they only had Beleriand, Meraxes, and Vega. I mean, look, we don't know how dragon breeding works. There does appear to be some differences between Vagar and, uh, sorry, between all the different dragons now. Like, Caraxes looks very different to the others, but maybe that's not genetic diversity. Maybe Caraxes has a noodle neck because he is the product of 300 years of dragon incest. Five. Yeah, thank you in the live chat. Yeah, the books do say a number. It's five dragons that the Targaryens had on Dragonstone originally. So, yeah, I mean, is that enough genetic diversity maybe um maybe they're messed up thanks for the super chat from jw he says it feels like the writers haven't fully considered the implications of a wandering dragon rider reeks of fan fiction um i agree that it's important 
like the bond between Sea Smoke and Sea Smoke's rider Lainor. Like, what what's the deal there? Like, can you abandon a dragon like that? I don't think there are any examples um, in the books of a rider like abandoning and permanently separating from their dragon. I mean, Daenerys chains up. Um, I mean, Daenerys is estranged from her dragon Drogon for a while. Like, Dragon, D- Drogon just, like, goes loose in the Dothraki Sea and goes loose around the Slaver's Bay area for a while when Daenerys sort of rejects Drogon. But then Drogon comes back, so... And they reestablish that connection. So I don't know if you ever can, like, permanently reject your dragon. Um, so will Sea Smoke follow Lainor? Or maybe Sea Smoke will believe that Lainor is dead. I mean... Uh, how would Sea Smoke know that Lainor is still alive? Like, maybe there's some psychic connection that can cross over a continent. But it, but if Lainor goes far enough away, like, if Lainor crosses the Narrow Sea, maybe, you know, with enough distance, it's impossible for Sea Smoke to know. I mean, you know, th- there is sometimes a sense in the books that the dragons know things. Like, you know, Beleriand the Black Dread flew back to Valyria, seemingly in the books earlier in the reign of King Jaehaerys. And he carried this Targaryen girl, Arya Targaryen, on his back. And Arya's body got infested with terrifying Valyrian worms, fire worms, with human faces infested Arya's body and she died. That's a whole thing in the book. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I wonder, I wonder what will happen with Sea Smoke. Thanks for the super chat from Gunnar, who says, Kind of sad what happens to Helena if we get another time skip when she gets her children. No spoilers here. Thanks for the super chat from Pro, who says, Aegon reminds me of Bobby B. Yeah, all Aegon seems to want to do is drink and have sex. Um, And unlike Bobby B, Aegon does not have the redeeming characteristic of, like, having been a cool warrior previously or having overthrown a mad king. Aegon Aegon does not really have any redeeming characteristics. I think he is amusing. Like, he's funny to watch. Um, I like how he calls Aemon de twat in the previous episode. Like, Like, he's funny. But, uh, yeah, he he doesn't share any of the redeeming qualities of Robert, those that they have. Thanks for the super chat from uh, the African sci-fi scholar who says, I'll take a Night King's javelin throw through an old dragon scale any day. Yeah, so, I mean, with regards to the the vulnerability of dragons in Game of Thrones Season 7... Uh, we saw the Night King do a do, do a Olympic javelin throw performance um, and killed Daenerys's dragon Vis- Vis- Viserion with his icy javelin, um, and that's not a euphemism. Um, but unless the Night King turns up in House of the Dragon, I'm not expecting javelins to be a major plot point in House of the Dragon. Thanks for the super chat from Neil, who says, for a goat with a candle on his head. Hugs from Berlin. Thank you, Neil. Thanks for the super chat from Freddy, who says, Does Daemon have affection for his daughters? He hasn't spoken to them since their mother died, at least not in a scene. Or are they just, for him, a byproduct of his relationship with Lena? Yeah, I mean, Rayna Targaryen was complaining last episode that um, Daemon ignores her, Rayna said, and just focuses on Baylor. So, you know, and we saw Daemon teaching Bela the Valyrian language. Um, so he does seem to have some interest in Bela, but he seems to have an interest in Bela because she's a dragon rider. So does Daemon only love his daughter because she has a dragon and a dragon is power? Um, there was a there was an image that was shared by HBO of Daemon hugging and consoling Bela and Reyna after the death of Lena. But that wasn't used in the actual episode. And in the actual episode, we had Daemon just sort of like awkwardly standing next to his grieving children. And then he walked away. (laughs) It's like, what are you doing, Daemon? Just like walking away from your grieving children after the death of their mother? Um, And yeah, there was like this image as well that was released, but we didn't actually get any dialogue. So it looks as though maybe they filmed a scene where Daemon was consoling his daughters. But it didn't actually make it into any episodes. So, yeah, like, I don't... It doesn't seem like Daemon is a great dad. At least, you know, what's in the uh, episodes itself. 
I hope we get to see more interactions with them and we learn what their deal is. It would not shock me if Daemon was a shit dad. Like, he's not a great person, all in all. Um, so, yeah, I wonder how those kids will do. It'd be tough being Daemon's daughter. Thanks for, I mean, but but I think the dragon riding thing is important. Like, like they, they clearly distinguished that Daemon loves Bela or shows more interest in Bela than Reyna because Bela has a dragon. So I think, you know, there aren't a lot of conversations happening in the show about who has dragons and the importance of having dragons. But I think Daemon is definitely aware and definitely paying attention. Thanks, Saladek. We just talked about like, yeah, I think Daemon... Is interested in Baylor for her dragon, but we haven't seen a whole lot of like genuine affection b- from Daemon for his children as of yet. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Keen Aesthetic, who says the Targaryens started with five dragons on Dragonstone and then had only three dragons during Aegon's conquest. Uh, and then 130 years after the conquest, we have 120 years after the conquest. Uh, is now, and now there's dragons all over. So Keen is saying, where did all these dragons come from? Why are there lots of dragons now when there weren't many dragons previously? And that is a good question. And I think that it borderline is a plot hole. (laughs) Um, But I think the best explanation we have is that there is a sense of like rising and falling tides of magic in this world. Um, Like Quaith in book two says that, oh, Daenerys, like you birthed dragons and now there is more magic coming into the world um so so there is like this intimate connection between dragons in the world and all magic just the background radiation level of magic that's in this universe um and so maybe you know and there's also this thing about the white walkers where it's like uh do the white walkers come when the winter is cold or is the winter cold because the White Walkers came? And so even with the White Walkers... And the question of, like, why did the White Walkers come when they did? Why why now, after thousands of years of absence, are the White Walkers back now? And I think that the answers to all these questions might be... Uh, magic naturally just comes uh, and goes, like the tides. It's like El Nino and El Nino. Um, there's just this sort of natural, weird... Cycle, And you can see that as like an unbalanced thing connected to the seasons, because in this world, the seasons are irregular. Sometimes winter goes for 10 years. Sometimes summer goes for 10 years. Sometimes it's only two years. You get short winters and long winters and it's all out of kilter. And there was a blurb on one of the Game of Thrones books. The blurb of the book said that after a what was it after a preternatural event, the seasons are disordered or something. And George Martin has said that the seasons will be restored to order. That the seasons will be resolved at the end of the series. So my point is that maybe we're currently in this like weird situation where magic and the seasons and the winters and the summer and the White Walkers and the dragons, all this fire and ice, is just sort of careening around and changing, swinging like a pendulum. It's all in this unnatural, unbalanced, swinging, changing flux. And maybe that's why sometimes dragon eggs do hatch and there are lots of dragons everywhere and sometimes they don't. And sometimes there are white walkers everywhere and sometimes there aren't because it's this cyclical wonky thing. And maybe they will restore balance to the force at the end of the series and then maybe the seasons will become regular and then maybe there will be no more dragons and no more white walkers i think that that would work as like an ending and as a resolution to the changing tides of magic and dragons in the show and in the books um is that Sunfire? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So, like, we have... It has been mentioned that uh, Aegon Targaryen has a beautiful golden dragon called Sunfire. And maybe maybe that's it? Uh, c- could it be Cyrax instead? Cyrax is yellow. It is a little confusing. Um, it's, a, it's a little difficult to tell the dragons apart. Because, yeah, we have the golden Sunfire and we have the yellow Cyrax. And Arax is also said to be... I think, like, pale with golden highlights, uh, Luke's dragon, Arax. Um, I like how, you know, Caraxes looks very different to the others, and Vagar is huge, so it looks very different. Sea Smoke looks quite distinctive. But I hope that Sunfire... I don't know. I, I kind of hope that that's not Sunfire, 
Because Sunfire is meant to look magnificent. Like, Sunfire is the most often described as, like, wow, this is a really fucking cool-looking dragon you got there. It's like a shiny Pokemon. It really stands out. Um, so, I hope that when Sunfire turns up, we notice. Like, it is so, like, glittering gold that it's, like, impossible not to notice how cool it is. That's what I hope. That's what I hope. Uh, Patrick in the live chat says that the flying one is Cyrax. Yeah. Yeah, that, he's, he's got that sort of flat head, doesn't he, Cyrax, or her. So, yeah, maybe it's not, maybe it's not Sunfire. Um, thanks for the super chat from What in the Tambor, who says, I like how they thematically connected Vega to the sea with all the rigging and the ropes, which makes sense because Lena was a Valarion and the Valarions are connected to the sea. Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't notice that because, yeah, there are all these ropes on Vegar's back that were like swinging around when Lena was flying. And yeah, that, that totally does evoke the rigging on a ship. And the Valarions have this deep connection with the sea, as as we saw when they like dropped the coffin in the sea. So yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Thanks for the super chat from Brinks, who says, I don't quite understand Amon's hostility towards Lena and the Valarion kids. Had he even met them before? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we saw um, a bit of hostility between the kids in the yard uh, in the previous episode. We saw that, you know, when they were sparring and training, um, there was a little bit of hostility. I mean, it was mostly like Aegon was being hostile to people. But I think Aemon, you know, he was part of that sort of Alicent's kids versus Rhaenyra's kids vibe. Um, but yeah, like it, it is a bit extreme the way Amond, you know, started fighting these kids. I mean, I think they started it, didn't they? Who, who, th- who threw the first punch? Like Amond said something mean and then the girls, Bela and Raina first attacked Amond. So they started the actual fight. Well, well, all right. All right. You know, she ran towards him and Amond pushed her down. So she like ran towards him. And then, and then Amon started throwing punches and then the boys got in on it as well. Um, but yeah, like, I think the reason why Amon was so sort of hostile is that he was on this mad rush of power. He had just taken control of the most powerful weapon of war in this world. Um, so I think he's full of adrenaline. He's like full of like, you know, he's just like shaking with energy. Uh, and he channeled that into aggression because he's got this, you know, he was bullied and he feels like he's got a chip on his shoulder. So that, that kind of makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Amond started the hostility with words, but he didn't start like the physical violence, did he? We can take a closer look later, but I, I think that the, you know, Amond was definitely being a dick. I mean, you know, I'll feed you to my dragon. And I think picking up a rock... Like, he escalated it with, like, weapons. Was it Amon who first picked up a rock? Yeah, we, we, we can... We can... We can... Examine that later. But, um, yeah, I think that that's what was going on with Amon emotionally. Thanks for the super chat from Isaiah, who says... Oh, well, yeah, and as they say in the live chat, um, yeah, and also part of why Amon is hostile to Jason Luke is because Luke was one of the main people who gave Amon the pink dread pig in the previous episode. So Amond was bullied by Luke specifically. So that may, that's part of where that hostility is coming from. And yeah, in the books, it's a little bit different. Like in the books, uh, Bela and Reyna aren't involved in this fight. Uh, it's actually uh, Joff, Luke, and also... Yeah, well, well yeah, it, it's Jace and Luke and also Joff, like the youngest child who's currently like a baby, is three years old um, at this point in the books. And it's actually Joff, like the little three-year-old, who is the one who first confronts Amond. Here they are, Jace, Luke, and Joff, um, as they appear in the books. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, Amond pushed Joff into a pile of dragon droppings <laughs> when Joff tried to stop Amond. Uh, we didn't get to see the dragon poop this episode, sadly. Um, but otherwise, the, the fight is quite similar. Thanks for the super chat from Isaiah, who says, what are your thoughts on Viserys's stroke game? No comment. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Laura, who says, what is Laris's end game? 
Yeah, well, there are some great lines in the book talking about how Laris is an enigma, and historians to this day uh, question what were Laris's motivations. I think that L- Laris is clearly trying to get power, uh, and he is making this conflict worse, and I think it's a bit like Littlefinger, creating chaos for his own empowerment. Chaos is a ladder. And I think he's also got, like, a grudge against the world and wants to punish the world for him being looked down upon for being having a funny leg and so on. Uh, thanks for the super chat from the Caveless Bear, who says, Do you think people were pretending to not know about the heritage of Rhaenyra's children, or they just didn't care? Corliss seems to rationalize it. Yeah, Corliss said pretty directly that, like, you know, he he he, he doesn't dispute that Jace and Luke aren't his biological grandchildren. They aren't the biological children of Lainor, but he says he doesn't care. Like, blood is not that important to him. He's more interested in his name, the Valerion name. He wants uh, Gisaris Valerion to in- to take the throne of Westeros, and he wants Lucerus Valerion to take Driftmark and High Tide. Um, so, he knows. And Viserys knows, and I think everyone at court knows. It's like Aegon says this episode, like, everyone knows, just look at them. Just look at them. And, like, you know, Viserys also rationalized it, saying that, oh, well, sometimes horses have funny-looking horses. Um, But, um, yeah, I I think it's pretty obvious to everyone, because they have dark hair and because they have pale skin, they don't look like Lane or so. Uh, You know, there are political reasons and emotional reasons why people choose not to see it, but I think everyone knows that they're bastards. Um, And obviously that's a big deal because bastards aren't meant to inherit the same way true-born children are, so arguably Alicent's son Aegon is heir to the throw instead. Thanks for the super chat from Jackie, who says, Laris is telling Alicent he owes her or else. I think think he's behind (laughs) blood and cheese. Um, yeah, so I, I do think that you almost get a sense that Laris is blackmailing Alicent. Like, he's saying, I can help you, but also I committed a murder in your name, and so I've got dirt on you, so I could say that, you know, you ordered me to kill Lord Harwin Strong, and that would be a big deal. Um, I, I feel like, you know, Alicent maybe should just, like, turn Laris in. Like, maybe Alicent should say, like, hey, King Viserys, hey, Otto Hightower... Laris Strong murdered his father and brother, and now he's blackmailing me, and it's really fucked up. I think that Otto and Viserys would definitely side with Alicent, not Laris Strong. So, you know, I think the fact that Alicent is accepting Laris, along with all of his evil and all of his dangers, it shows that Alicent is willing to use Laris, you know? So, uh, I think that, uh, I think there's, there is a degree of culpability there, that Alicent is not you know, making Laris pay for his crime. Thanks for- well, yeah, and, and Drogon in the live chat says that Rhaenyra could just legitimize the strong boys once she becomes queen. Yeah, that is another, like, important issue that um, probably should be talked about. Uh, because kings, and I suppose queens on the throne, have the power to legitimize. It's like how Roose Bolton made Ramsay Snow into the legitimate Ramsay Bolton. Ramsay was a bastard who was legitimized, and that made it possible for him to actually inherit the Dreadfort. Um, and so, yeah, theoretically, Rhaenyra or King Viserys uh, could do the same thing. When they're on the throne, they could say, hey, uh, Jason, Luke, and Joffrey, yeah, they are bastards. They are the children of Harwin Strong. But... I legitimize them, and once they're legitimized, they no longer have the taint of varsity, and then they could actually inherit. Um, And so, in theory, like, legalistically, that would make them uh, Rainier's legitimate heirs, but the fact is that, you know, inheritance does not always work the way that it's meant to in the law books. Sometimes people have their own opinions, and sometimes there's disputes, regardless of what the laws might might or might not actually say. And, and like, the the exact, you know, rules of, you know, primogeniture and whatever are not all that well established at this point anyway. Like, because, you know, Magor took the throne that should have gone to Aenys' son, and then, like, Jaehaerys took the throne, even though he had elder siblings, and then, like, um, and then bloody uh, Rhaenys was passed over, and so, like, it seems as though it's always the eldest male, but then Viserys changes his mind and says, no, it goes to Rhaenyra, even though she's female. So, like, the rules have never been clear or consistent. So, you know, I think something as simple as Jace, Luke, and Joff being legitimized, like, it, 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 
it might hurt more than it helps. I think that maintaining the lie that these kids are Lainors will probably do more um, for their uh, support than legitimizing them would. Because the thing is, like, if you legitimize Jace, Luke, and Joff and say that, no, they are not Lainor Valarion's children, you're going to lose the support of Lord Corlys Valarion. If Corlys doesn't get to extend his legacy, if Corlys doesn't get to say, those are my grandchildren, Corlys is not going to support Rhaenyra anymore. And Corlys is, like, the second most powerful lord in Westeros. The Valerions are the second most powerful house with all of their ships and with their dragons. So it's a really bad idea to antagonize the Valerions. And if you admitted that Jace, Luke, and Joff aren't Valerions, you would antagonize the crap out of them. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Interstellar Green Bean, who says the actors seem to be doing a great job with the Valyrian language. Is the guy who created the language on Got involved? Yeah, I th- yeah, I think his name is David Peterson. Invented the Valyrian language. George Martin in the books had like a few words, like Dracarys, uh, and he also made up some Dothraki words. But then David Peterson, who was like the guy in Hollywood for making fictional languages, actually turned Dothraki into, and Valyrian into real languages. And yeah, I, I like how they use Valari- uh, Valyrian in this show. Like it actually has a political purpose, you know, because it is the Targaryens and the Valarions who speak it, which emphasizes their Valyrian ancestry. And I like how Daemon and Rhaenyra use it as this um, intimate language between them to like keep other people out of their intimate conversations. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if Peterson is involved in this specifically, but um, he did create the language and I do like how they use it. Thanks for the donation from J.O. who says, I don't like Lenor leaving versus dying. It leaves Sea Smoke's future in limbo. Uh, yeah, like I, I would like them to address it one way or the other. What happens to Sea Smoke? Can anyone else claim Sea Smoke while Lenor is gone? Um, and will Sea Smoke be sad? I want to know that too. Thanks for the super chat from Laura and from Kaios. Who says, why was Corlys so upset at that guy for Lenor grieving in the sea? Well, Lenor was possibly a bit drunk and he was like standing in the ocean during his sister's funeral. Uh, He was making a scene. He was making a bit of a scene. Um, And so Corlys told Carl to go and fetch him. Um, And I I quite like I quite like the line that Corlys used. He said something like, uh, retrieve your patron. So next time, you know someone's too drunk and making a spectacle of themselves at a party, I think that their significant other should be told, retrieve your patron. Um, Because Lainor's sad. His sister is dead, and I think that that is making him confront his own mortality, you know? And I think Lainor is asking himself, what is my life? Like, who am I? Like, I'm married to this person who I don't love, and I've got these children that I'm a father to, even though they're not really mine, and... I, what, 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 I don't really want to be here, but I have these duties. And, and that's I think, is what leads him to make this, you know, commitment to Rhaenyra, sort of offering to actually do his duty. But then Rhaenyra, I suppose, allows him to not take it. I, I almost wish there was a moment where Rhaenyra said, hey, Lainor, like, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> like, you're allowed to leave. That would make sense. Um, thanks for the super chat from the Cat Files. Happy for birthday, Vega. Thanks for the super chat from Max, who says, It's worth noting that Alicent tried making amends multiple times when they were teens and was pushed aside. So I can understand her adult motives. Did Alicent try to make amends? I mean, I don't know if she tried to make amends exactly. Like, like there was that mo- I mean, there was that time when Rainier and Alicent, like, tried to reconnect and then... Rhaenyra told Alicent that she didn't have sex with Daemon. Or well, she said, you know, Daemon never touched me. Like, there was that moment when they were almost close again. And so, as a result of that, Alicent then sided with Rhaenyra and said, I believe her. She didn't have sex with anyone. Um, and even to Otto later, she was saying that I think that Rhaenyra is innocent. So, she was, like, supporting Rhaenyra. Um but then soon after, Laris told Alicent about the moon tea. Uh, Alicent started getting suspicious, and then she found out from Kristen that it was a lie. And then that was when she went, like, full against. So, you know, yeah, like, like there was a moment when they were more friendly for a moment, but 
he didn't last that long. Um, I think that she should have talked to Rhaenyra. <laughs> like, I think that the first, like, the first thing Rhaenyra should have done after hearing about the moon tea is said, like, hey, Rhaenyra, like, I heard about this moon tea. Be honest with me. Like, stop bullshitting me. Like, I, someone is bullshitting me. Is it you? Like, give Rhaenyra another chance to tell the truth. Because, like, you know, yes, like, she did confront Alison earlier. She, she did confront Rhaenyra earlier. And Rhaenyra probably should have told the truth then. But, like, give Rhaenyra another chance. But but Alison didn't give Rhaenyra another chance. She just, like, came out in her green dress and called her stepdaughter. And it was, like, FUs all around, you know? So... I, I think that it's understandable. Like, I mean, Alicent, I think, is not communicating well. Like, her father doesn't communicate well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I wish that Alicent tried harder to make peace. And I wish that Rhaenyra didn't lie so much. Both of them have culpability in this conflict. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Brini, who says, What was going on with the conversation between Aegon and Aemond after the funeral? Yeah, so Aegon and Helena are betrothed. They are not married yet, but they are going to be married is the plan. They're, they're engaged. Aegon and Helena are, are fiancé and fiancée. Is that the terminology? Um, even though they're brother and sister. Targaryen incest to continue the dynasty. Um, thanks for the super chat from Batter, who says Valyrian steel cuts clean. Rhaenyra gets a flesh wound. She, yeah, look, I I feel like they made, like, not a big deal of that giant wound in uh, Rhaenyra's arm. I feel like that should have been more of a problem. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat from Sarang, who says, Did Laris warg into his mutes a la Euron? Uh, yeah, that's a fun idea. Yeah, um, because there is this character, Euron Greyjoy who in the show is a idiot and in the books is the most terrifying character in the whole series. Uh, Euron in the books is magic and heretical and murderous and incestuous and everything evil. Um, and there is speculation that Euron might have skin changing powers and that he may have been a former student of Bloodraven and that Euron uh, may be walking into the Dusky Woman. The Dusky Woman is a woman uh, who is Dusky, believe it or not. Um, and she is given to Victarion as a sex slave. And uh, some fans speculate that Euron might skin change into the Dusky Woman to keep an eye on Victarion, even though Victarion has sex with the Dusky Woman. And if that sounds fucked up, it's because it is. And Euron is. Um, and so, Sarang in the super chat is suggesting that maybe Laris walks into his mutes because the dus the dusky woman is also a mute, and also like Euron's crew on his ship, the Silence, are all mutes. They don't have tongues, and so I like the idea that Euron might walk into his crew as a way of controlling them because I think it would be difficult to control a crew who can't talk, you know, a little bit difficult to communicate. So maybe Laris Strong's silent mute men are controlled by Laris through skin changing magic. It's a wild theory. It's not, it's not likely to be true. Um, but I think it's a fun idea. Okay. Um, it has been two and a half hours. So we're going to wrap this stream up soon. Um, I'm going to quickly respond to a bunch of super chats. I apologize uh, for any super chats that I miss, but I'm going to do as many as I can. And then we're going to take a brief look at the on the next episode preview. And then we're going to wrap it up and we're going to start working on the explained video about this episode. Um, so press the like button, press the subscribe button. Um, and whatever you do, don't go and subscribe to the Alt Swift X YouTube channel because it would be a real disaster if that channel hit 100k subscribers. Uh, thanks to the super chat from Gingerbread, who says Rhaenyra helped Lenor and Carl do exactly what Krispy Kreme asked her to do. Great ending. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, because Chris and Cole asked Rhaenyra to run away with him to the east, and maybe that's what gave. Uh, maybe that's what gave Rhaenyra the idea. Hey, I should let Lenor do what Kristen wanted to do. Um, which <laughs> I, I guess that shows that Rhaenyra has been thinking about Kristen and she has seen 
she has seen how badly it went, like, making Kristen stick around. And I guess maybe that might have been part of why Rhaenyra decided to let Lenor go. Like, forcing Kristen to stay around uh, went badly. So, maybe Rhaenyra doesn't want to force Lenor to stay around. She allows him to go free and do what he wants instead. Yeah, I think that's a that's a cool point. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Tambi Lee, who says, How is Viserys throwing a fit over Daemon and Rhaenyra? If his kids are to be married, quite the hypocrisy. Well, well, no, like Viserys isn't like no no one's angry about Rhaenyra and Daemon because they are uncle and niece getting married. People are angry like Targaryen incest is is fine as far as the Targaryens are concerned. The problem with Daemon and Rhaenyra's marriage is that they didn't get permission from the king to do it. And they married immediately after the deaths of their respective spouses, Lenor and Lena. And so that's just seen as an insult and it's just out of everyone's control and no permission. And that's why that is an issue. Thanks for the super chat from Robbie, who says they're going to ruin Laris like they did with Baelish by making him overtly sinister slash creepy. Yeah, I think that's a fair point because Littlefinger in the TV show, like he started out being kind of subtle. Like, you know, what is this guy's deal? Like, we don't know exactly what, what Littlefinger wants and what he's up to. But then very quickly, Littlefinger devolved into like a mustache twirling evil dude, evil genius who who spoke in a voice like this. And he was like, Sansa, I want to have the throne. And he was obviously a bad guy in the later seasons. Um, And they are doing something similar with Laris because Laris in the books is very ambiguous. I mean, everyone's kind of ambiguous in the books because there's so little detail in Fire and Blood. Um, but I agree, they're making Laris very obviously a bad guy, and that might sort of undermine the ambiguity that makes him interesting. Um, we've got a little bit of, um, technical, uh, complications from Adobe here. Thanks, Adobe. Your annual subscription is really paying off. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Olivia, who says, That scene of Amond hanging on to Vega's reins made my stomach flip. Yeah, I, I thought it was fun, and I thought it was visceral when Amond w- was being flung about on Vega's back. Um, we, we, a bit of technical difficulties, but uh, yeah, that was that was a cool scene. Oh my fucking god. Uh Okay, Adobe's unhappy. Um, please bear with me. Uh, <laughs> God fucking damn it. <laughs> uh, thanks for the super chat from Merciful, who says, Watching the kids try to explain what happened to the adults talking over one another it was so realistic. I know a kid lost an eye, but they were beat up, and that's how kids actually argue. Yeah. Yeah, th- there's a line in the books about um, the, the cruelty of children is well known. Um, and so, yeah, the, these children, I think, are uh, almost as bad at conflict resolution as their parents are. Sorry for the... Technical difficulties. Blame the Adobe Corporation. Fucking hell. Uh, Technical difficulties. Sorry about this. Uh, Give me a second. Oh my god. I hope we will be back shortly. Okay. Hopefully we're back. Thanks for the super chat from Harrison, who says, Could Daemon's hood be like a reverse fight club? It's like things the rumors said, which he did, which were completely uninvolved. Um... You're saying that, like, a reverse fight club. You're saying that Daemon, like, didn't really kill Rhea? I'm not sure what you mean, Harrison. Thanks for the super chat from KO, who says, Boy, go skizzard to the face. Thank you, KO. Thank you, Kyref. Thank you, Hurdur, who says, How much should Jace and Luke fear Daemon? Why should Jace and Luke fear Daemon? Yeah, okay, all right, I see what you're, I see what you're saying. 
Um, Because now that Daemon has married Rhaenyra, they might produce children, because that's what uh, marriages do in this world. And in our world. Um, And thing is, uh, Daemon is now a stepfather to Jace and Luke and Joffrey. And step-parents don't always get along with their stepchildren. It grieves me to say. Um, So it might be that Daemon, being a sort of a murderous, ambitious guy, maybe Daemon wants Jace and Luke and Joff dead so that his own children with Rhaenyra can inherit Rhaenyra's throne. Um, that would not be unprecedented. So yeah, that's an interesting idea. Maybe Jason Luke should be afraid of the new stepdad, Daemon. Um, uh, you know, and Daemon also has Baylor and Raina to think about. So yeah, I think that's an interesting point, Herder. Thanks for the super chat from Sitlali, who says, Why would the Kingsguard not try to break up the Alicent Rhaenyra fight? Yeah, I mean, I think they just wanted a dramatic moment. But yeah, I mean, if I was some of these Kingsguard, I think it would be a good idea to not let the queen kill the princess. Uh, They just sort of like formed a circle and everyone's just like, "Eh, let's see how this plays out. (laughs) They just enjoyed watching it go down when, yeah, I think they should have intervened. Thanks for the super chat from Alvaravo, who says, do you think that Rhaenyra planned the Lenor escape? Yeah, I mean, I think Daemon was in on it. Um, and I guess Rhaenyra was as well. Because, yeah, there was some dialogue. I didn't see it at first, but there was some dialogue where they said, grant him this kindness, set him free. Um, so was Daemon saying that to Carl or was Daemon saying that to Rhaenyra? I'll have to rewatch. But, uh, I guess Rhaenyra was in on it. Yeah, letting them go. Especially after the conversation that Rhaenyra had with Lenor. Thanks for the super chat from Mitch. We already talked about Daeron Targaryen. There is another son who I think will appear later in the show because there are four bloodstreams coming from Alicent in the opening sequence. Thanks for the super chat from Christian. Yeah, yeah. it's almost like Laris is sort of like gaslighting Alicent into thinking that Laris's ideas are what Alicent wants. You know, like I think Laris is sort of playing mind games with Alicent, manipulating her. Um, I wonder if he's going to try and control her, and I wonder if Alicent is going to allow that. Thanks for the super chat from Jack, who says, Why not use both men? Lenor is a warrior, dragon rider, and political ally. Rhaenyra could have kids with Daemon who look like Lenor. Oh, and the rumors give all the boys legitimacy. That That's an interesting idea. I, I think you're right that, like, if Rhaenyra had some bastard kids with Daemon, if Rhaenyra didn't marry Daemon and instead stayed married to Lenor and had kids with Daemon anyway, they would look Valyrian and they would r- stop the rumours about bastardy, hopefully. Um, and yeah, Lenor is a very valuable ally because he's a dragon rider. So yeah, maybe the smart thing to do would have been to stay married to Lenor and have kids with, ca- have kids with Daemon anyway. I-, I don't think it's meant to be like the most rational political decision for Rhaenyra and Daemon to marry each other. Like, clearly this is partly about sexual desire with them. And, you know, both of them are these rebellious people. I think I think this is an act of defiance against their family and defiance against the system. They're trying to express their true desires in defiance of everybody else. So, yeah, it, it might not be the most politically smart idea to get rid of Lenor, a valuable ally, and to, you know, piss people off. You know, like especially, you know, the alliance with the Valerions is so important. So uh, getting rid of Lenor is probably not a good idea in that respect either. Um, we're not going to talk about future characters just yet. Thanks for the super chat from Sherry, who says, did you like Westworld season four? I haven't seen it yet, but I look forward to seeing it. Uh, thank you, Nikolai, who says, I like how this show actually shows difficult conversations being had. Unlike the cutaways every time a tough conversation comes up in Game of Thrones Season 8. Yeah, I agree with that. There were a lot of moments in Game of Thrones Season 8 where it's like, Ooh, I wonder how Sansa and Arya will react to finding out that Jon is actually the son of Rhaegar Targaryen. But instead of showing us the conversation, it just cuts away here in Episode 4. Um, there were multiple moments like that. I, 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 like, like... The whole, like, a large chunk of the final episode of Game of Thrones Season 8, the final episode of the series, had no dialogue in it. 
And that can be a legitimate artistic choice. Like, you, you can let the visuals speak for themselves and the actors' faces speak. But uh, I think that in that case, it just showed that they couldn't think of anything good for the characters to say. I think in that case, it was a failure of writing that there was so little dialogue in the final episode. So, yeah, I think Hot D is better in that respect. Thanks, Pitso, who says Jess and Luke have a dad who's as fun as an uncle. Yeah, so Jesseris and Lucerus now have Daemon as a stepdad, and maybe that will be fun. Uh, Fariko speculates that uh, Reina Targaryen might claim sea smoke. Maybe. Reina didn't get to claim her mother Lena's dragon, Vega. Maybe she will get to cu- to claim her uncle's dragon, Sea Smoke. Sure. Thanks for the super chat from Ash, who says that Alicent's thinly veiled self righteousness is insufferable. All I see is subconscious resentment of Rhaenyra, and the kingdom will suffer for it. Yeah, I mean, Alicent says as much, doesn't she? Like Alicent says, um, you you flaunt. What exactly is her word? What, what exactly does Alison say to Rhaenyra? Like, like she is angry at, you know, Rhaenyra's behavior. Forever upholding the kingdom, the family, the law. Alison feels like she's been doing it, but Rhaenyra has been flaunting it all to do as she pleases. So it's all the same stuff we talked about last week. Alison feeling resentful that Rhaenyra breaks the rules while Alison has to follow the rules. Thanks, Mike, who says they could have had a lot of eggs during the pre-conquest and conquest times but not enough kids to bond with slash hatch them. Yeah, I mean, maybe dragon eggs, you can sort of leave dragon eggs in storage for a while and the eggs will only hatch when they are, when they are close to a Targaryen who could bond with them. Yeah, like, like they only brought five dragons from Valyria to Dragonstone, but maybe they brought a whole bunch of eggs and maybe the eggs only hatch when there is a Targaryen to ride them. Like, maybe, like there isn't a lot of clarity about how that works in the books. So yeah, I think that's that's worthy speculation. Uh, Ranark says, was that Lenor at the end? Yeah, Lenor and Carl rode into the sunset like Gendry. Gunnar says, Amond is ice cold, insulting his auntie and stealing her dragon. What was the Valyrian phrase he commanded to Vega? Yeah, Amond said some word. Uh, he's L- Likiri. I, uh, my, my Valyrian's a little bit rusty. I haven't learned it on Duolingo yet. I don't know what Likiri means. He, he did also say, I mean, Dehyrus we know means like serve, like obey. Um, but Amond also said Solves, which I guess means fly. I'm assuming from context. Thanks for the super chat from Dish, who says, did you notice that Aegon says brother when Otto kicks him from his drunken stupor? Did Amond regularly fight back when Amond was drunk? Yeah, there was that interesting moment where Otto Hightower, like, found Aegon drunk in a stairwell at the funeral. Um, and I, I like that because it sort of suggested that, like, Otto is the one guy who can actually sort of carouse everyone and, and bring a bit of order. You know, like, like everyone at this funeral is just sort of wandering around, getting drunk, having sex with their uncle, like Rhaenyra is with Daemon. But Otto is the guy who's like, okay, let's, let's behave ourselves. Let's be proper here. Like, Otto is going to try and kick some order into this situation because Viserys is increasingly letting go of the reins as his, you know, his body falls apart literally and his mind is falling apart thinking that Alicent is Emma. So I think that Otto is going to attempt to... Uh, uh, assert some order to this court, and I think that he is going to certainly favor Alicent over anyone else. But, um, I mean, yeah, with Aegon and Amond, like, we've seen Aegon bully Amond, and yeah, it's weird that Aegon initially thought that Otto was Amond. Um, I wonder why. Um, like, why did Aegon assume that Otto was the one kicking him? Maybe kicking people is something that Amond does. Maybe Aegon was just thinking about Amond. I don't know. Thanks for the super chat from Master Cheese, who says, What would Otto say to Alicent if he found out that she had rejected Rhaenyra's proposal to marry Jaceris to Helena? Yeah, maybe Otto would have been Machiavellian and smart enough to seriously consider marrying Alicent's kid to Rhaenyra's kid. Um, like, Otto did say that, like, ooh, conflict is inevitable. But I-, I think that Otto may have seen that as an opportunity for peace. Because, like, Otto... Otto doesn't sound like he wants war as such. He just believes that war is inevitable. 
Um, and unlike Alicent, Otto doesn't have as much, like, skin in the game. Like, Otto doesn't have, like, a deep emotional grudge against Rhaenyra like Alicent does. So Otto might not be as against the idea of marrying them together. But, you know, maybe it's also possible that Otto would have said, no, like, don't marry your daughter to a bastard. That only compromises us. So, yeah, yeah, uh, that's an interesting idea. Maybe Otto would have been cool with that. Thanks for the super chat from Beep Boop, who says, I have a theory that since Vega hatched closer to the time of Valyria, she's more obedient and obeys any blood of the dragon who isn't a dragon rider. Uh, I don't see evidence for that. I mean, maybe. I mean, I think Vega should be, like, different to other dragons, like, because Vagar is older and sort of from a different generation. She isn't like these young whippersnapper dragons around these days who don't listen to their parents, but, um, yeah, she could be a bit different. They had that line in the Dragon Pit last episode about, like, once you bond with the dragon, no one else, like, the dragon won't obey anyone else, which, which again emphasizes how significant it is that Amond is the one person in the world who controls the biggest dragon in the world. Uh, Doof Doof says that Lenor promised to do what Rhaenyra wants. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. So Doof Doof is saying that maybe Lenor didn't, like, want to run away as much as Lenor just obeyed Rhaenyra. Like, Rhaenyra ordered Lenor to run away. I mean, we saw in the previous episode that Rhaenyra ordered Lenor to stand by her. Um, so maybe once again, Rhaenyra ordered Lenor. She countermanded that and said, no, I actually want you to leave. Like Nymeria and Arya in Game of Thrones Season 1. Thanks, Fariko. Thanks, Kek W, who says, Why did Daemon kill Lenor's lover to kill Lenor? He actually paid him to fake Lenor's death and leave. Um, but in the books, it seems as though Daemon, Daemon may actually have ordered Carl to kill Lenor. Um, but they did it so that Daemon and Rhaenyra could marry. Tanya says, The scene gave me flashbacks of Bobby B coming back from the north. And having to kill Lady. Yeah, there absolutely is a parallel between that situation after the fight with Arya and Joffrey and this fight. Uh, thanks, Left of Today, who says, I want Alicent to have a bastard child to spite Viserys since he doesn't seem to care. I mean, hey, like, do we even have proof that Aegon and Helena and... Uh, Aemond are all Viserys' children? Do we have proof? Maybe Alison hooked up with some some uh, Valyrian person and had those kids with someone else. It would be the ultimate hypocrisy if Alison had a bastard, and it would be hilarious. Uh, there is a line in one of the books that says that uh, Alicent was deflowered by Daemon. So maybe Aegon Targaryen is actually secretly the bastard of Alicent and Daemon. I don't think that's true, but we could speculate. Thanks, Tanya, and thanks, Rannoch, who says that Alicent was horrified when Laris had Harwin burned, but Rhaenyra seems to barely give a second thought when Daemon talks of removing Laenor. Yeah, but I think she then agreed to actually let Laenor live. But, um, yeah, look, uh, Rhaenyra is a Targaryen. There's violence and fire in her, and I think that, uh, no one's hands are going to be clean at the end of this series. Uh... Brayden says that Lainor is Quaith, the masked woman in Game of Thrones Season 2. Thanks, Dark Aura. Thanks, Haley, who says, I think the only way a Jon Snow spin-off show works is if Bran becomes the main villain. Maybe Bran is an evil tree king. Yeah, I mean, if you consider the book lore, it makes perfect sense that King Bran the Broken uh, is evil. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that if you consider the book law, it makes a lot of sense that the person who we think of as Bran is actually now just an agent of Bloodraven, the Three-Eyed Crow. Um, because, I mean, they say in the show that, like, Bran says, I am not Bran anymore. I am the Three-Eyed Raven now. Um, he loses his personality, and he, I think he becomes a vessel for the old gods. Maybe not Bloodraven specifically, more just the old gods in general. Um, George Martin has a history of writing about uh, scary, evil hive minds controlling everything. So I think that uh, it'll be really interesting to see how this series ends in the books, because the books are very different to the TV show, the original series. Um, and if and when George ever finishes those books, I think that Bran being king might be a very dark and spooky thing. 
as opposed to a bland, wet fart, as it was in the Game of Thrones show. Tamash says, I wish I knew Daemon's motives. He seemed to want the throne, but with Lena, he was uninspired. Maybe marrying Rhaenyra will restore his passion. I agree, Tamash. I think that Daemon marrying Rhaenyra is him going, okay, fine. I tried running away in Pentos. I tried denying my ambition. I tried letting go. I tried being content. But fuck it. I'm a Targaryen. I want power. I want my niece. I want to just burn things and make fire and blood. And I, I'm just here to cause some havoc. Let's do it. Like, yeah, I think Daemon is getting back to old classic original Daemon. Like he tried to be new Coke Daemon. Now he's the original recipe, baby. And I think he's going to make some fire. Thanks for the super chat from DD. How did Rhaenyra and Daemon convince Lainor off screen to stage his own death to run away right after he promised to be better? Yeah, well said. I think that we sort of have to speculate in our own minds how exactly that worked. Because, yeah, Lainor kind of did spin on a dime there to abandon his entire life. But, you know, I think that, you know, he loves Carl and he doesn't love politics. So he's willing to give up his political life to embrace his Carl life. St. Darwin says, St. Darwin, uh, St. Darwin says, it's midnight, fuck Mondays, enjoyed the podcast, gotta go to bed, good night, Emma. Uh, Survivor Challenges says, do you think Helena will be one of the more sympathetic characters? Yeah, so like Helena in the books does not have much personality. There is very little description of like what kind of person Helena Targaryen is. Uh, let's get a picture of Helena bloody Targaryen. Like, I think the books describe Helena as being like uh, plump and happy. <laughs> and that's like as much description as we get. Uh, so I think that Helena's depiction in House of the Dragon is infinitely more interesting. Um, and I think that making her a dreamer is a really good choice because like as a dreamer, she doesn't have to like do things that she didn't do in the books. Like, they don't have to make any massive deviations that contradict the books. But as a dreamer, she can say things that give us insights and give us foreshadowing and raise questions. Maybe it'll connect to the prophecy. And there are later things that happen that might make Helena's prophecies personal to her. There's, there's a lot of cool things that they could do there. So, yeah, I think that I, I, I'm... Glad that they've done what they did with Helena. And yeah, like a sympathetic character is, is something they could do with her because um, I think Alicent and uh, potentially Rhaenyra are uh, not great as far as people go. So maybe Helena can be one of those more sort of relatable people who is like, you know, reacting as we would react to the atrocities happening around her. Beggars says, it's odd that viewers assume assume Daenerys and Rhaenyra would kill Alicent's kids in power, especially after Viserys was chosen with several other claimants without incident. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a thing, isn't it? Like, like this show started with the council at Harrenhal, which showed a disputed succession being resolved and then no one died. So you can sort of interpret that as like, well, maybe they should just do that again. Like, maybe they should host a, another great council. And instead of stabbing each other, they should just sit down and hold a vote with the lords as they did at Harrenhal, and then they can decide. Um, but another way of interpreting it is that that, that council at Harrenhal and like skipping over Rhaenys and choosing Viserys instead, you can also say that, well, that never was a real solution. No one was, well, I mean, some people were, but a lot of people were unhappy with that, like Corlys. Um, and that that solution was never really going to work. Like they were building on an unstable foundation from the beginning. So like it, it was always rotten. It was always going to fall. This has been a Jenga tower with fewer and fewer blocks getting more and more rickety year by year, generation by generation. And this collapse is the natural consequence of that, you know? So there's a few different ways you can look at it. Thanks, Doof Doof. Thanks, Justin, who says, I love you, Brianna. Good night, Alt Shift X. I haven't watched yet. Levi says, don't know if it was mentioned, but it was interesting that Kristen didn't obey Alicent. Yeah, I think Kristen is less of a loose cannon now than he was before the 10 year gap. And I think Kristen decided that cutting out the third in line to the throne, Lucerus Valerion in front of everybody 
was probably a bad idea. Uh, thanks, Luz Belito, who says maybe the Rings of Power writers will learn how to adapt a story. Brandon says, do you think Rhaenyra will tell Rhaenys about Laenor? Ooh, that's a cool idea, Brandon. Because, yeah, like, Rhaenyra made Laenor disappear, and uh, Rhaenys was very upset about the apparent death of her only son. Maybe Rhaenyra could say, hey, um, Auntie Rhaenys, uh, don't worry, he's actually fine. Sorry for putting a corpse in your fireplace. <laughs> I, I hope the smell, I hope you can remove the smell from the drapes. Uh, thanks, Matt, who says that Lionel seems like one of the few selfless advisors. Yeah, that's what Viserys said of his Hand of the King, uh, Lionel Strong, but apparently the one unbiased guy who just wanted his family to survive got barbecued by his own son, Laris. So, alas, there is, uh, there are very few unbiased peaceful men left in this story. Harrison says, I thought Daemon and Rhaenyra plotted the fake murder together. Uh, yep. And yeah, cultivating a Machiavellian fear in the in the public. Yeah, that that is part of it. Like Rhaenyra is saying, Rhaenyra and Daemon are saying like, let's fake Lenor's death, but make it look like we did it. Rhaenyra and Daemon are deliberately uh, trying to make people afraid of them by pretending to have murdered her husband. So so like that 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 is the beginning of their marriage. Their marriage started with a deliberately fake murder to make people afraid of them. Like my god, what what a honeymoon, you know? Like uh, so that really sets things off on a smart, dangerous, scary foot, doesn't it? Much like Laris's smart, scary, dangerous foot. Abadi says, I kept convincing myself that Joffrey was talking about another time period. Okay. Thanks for the super chat from Andrew, who says, I absolutely love Lara Strong. African sci-fi scholar says, I'm sure the Dragon Pit mechanics will not be happy about seeing Vagar again. Not that old school bus. Yeah, I mean, if you have to change the oil and repair the gaskets, uh, I think Vagar would be a dilapidated old dragon with a lot of aches and pains in her old grandma body um i'm not sure vagar would even fit in the dragon pit didn't lena didn't lena valerion say that previously she said that vagar's too big for the dragon pit so maybe they won't be the dragon keeper's problem mega says do dragons have their own opinions of each other would it be based on the dragon riders relationships or would they have their own rivalries I think that's a good question. I mean, we saw in the previous episode that Vagar was reluctant to kill Lena, which suggests that dragons, like, do have their own thoughts and feelings. And Vagar then agreed to kill Lena, which might suggest that Vagar perhaps psychically felt Lena's pain or just practiced some compassion. But, like, you know, since the Starks uh, can control animals through skin changing, a lot of people speculate that the Targaryens control dragons through a similar form of skin changing like on some psychic unconscious level because really like obviously like you know there's no way the dragons can hear the targaryens on their backs shouting dracarys through all of the wind and stuff and like how would the dragons know who their rider wants them to dracarys like dragons always seem to somehow know which target they are meant to burn like the dragons know who is on their rider's side and who isn't so i think it would make a lot of sense if there is a psychic connection there sasha says that alicent is acting like the righteous one but she's trying to steal rainier's birthright and advance her own interests like yeah but like also alicent is right that rainier's kids are bastards and therefore legally shouldn't inherit the throne depending on who you ask so you know they, they definitely are playing both sides with alicent there like she part, partly it's personal partly it's political um the 13 rulers of Karth have the same zakata symbol as the one laris strong uses says leaf is that true uh i see a bunch of different symbols on the 13 in game of thrones season 2 episode 4 uh, I'm seeing a lot of different necklaces. I'm not seeing a firefly badge. Do you, oh, do you mean these? You mean these things? <laughs> Is that what we're talking about? Firefly of Laris looks like this. So are you saying that that is the same as that? I don't know. What do, what do you think, chat? 
are the 13 rulers of Karth secretly working for Laris Strong all along? Yeah, look, I, uh, I, I'm doubtful, but I, I like your keen eyes. Yeah, that, yeah, well, they do all seem to have those little golden clips, don't they? Yeah, look, maybe Lar- maybe, maybe that is Laris. Maybe the clubfoot lives. Anyway, uh, thanks for the super chat from Hildra, who says, Rainier has set Lenor free. Yeah, I, I think that, I, I think that that was the plan. Uh, thanks, Robin, who says, is Alicent pregnant? Uh, I don't think she would hide being pregnant. I don't think she is pregnant, but uh, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, William says that uh, something about a spoiler. Daemon accepts Rhaenyra's power and agency. We've been talking for a long time, so we've got to end this. I'm going to quickly answer as many super chats as I can. Uh, Robert says Rhaenyra is becoming my least favorite character. Total narcissist who pays no mind to the consequences of her actions. Yeah, Rhaenyra... I, I mean, she was trying to be restrained in the confrontation with Alicent. Um, but marrying Daemon like this is certainly going to have consequences. Thanks, Curtis, William, Catelyn, and Sunkist says that Lenor abandoned Sea Smoke. Yeah, it's sad. Well, but you know, maybe Sea Smoke will follow. Maybe Lenor said, "Yo, Sea Smoke, we're going over here." Maybe, maybe Sea Smoke will follow, like a dog that that finds its owner. Um, thanks for the super chat from Christian, who says Likiri is similar to Umbas in High Valyrian, meaning calm. I can see someone's been on Duolingo. Uh, Ataha, we already talked about Daeron Targaryen. I think he might turn up later. Bill says, if Daemon and Rhaenyra die in a dragon accident, will Laris adopt his nephews? Laris's nephews? You mean? Oh, right. Yeah, well, Jace, Luke, and Joff are Harwin Strong's children. So, yeah, if Daemon and Rhaenyra died, maybe... Uh, Laris could say, hey, those are my brother Harwin's bastards, so I will adopt them and they can live in Harrenhal as Strongs. I mean, Laris needs some heirs, right? So unless Laris uh, is going to marry and have kids, maybe Jace, Luke and Joff are his uh, heirs. Yeah, that's that's an interesting idea for sure. Um, Nelly says, Lenor shaved his head like egg. But in the history books, he's murdered in Spicetown on Driftmark. So are the history books wrong? Uh, I mean, yeah, the books certainly explore the idea of the history books being wrong. And the books say that it's a mystery, like, why Carl killed Lenor. I think it is plausible that, you know, for the purposes of the show, they actually faked Lenor's death. Um, and yeah, they changed where it happened. Like, it happens in High Tide instead of in Spicetown, which is a town on Driftmark. So yeah, look, they are changing the lore of the books a little bit, but I think it's a cool and mostly consistent idea that, you know, it was a faked death, you know, like this is what they sort of got to do, like that they have to add mystery and subtlety to the very brief description in the book. Uh, Tambuli says that Laris probably doesn't care that he's the uncle to Luke and and Jace. Yeah, I, I don't think Laris strikes me as someone who wants a couple of nephews or a few nephews. Kamal asks about Daeron. I think we may see him later. Uh, Sasha says, why didn't Jaceris say Amond was about to smash Luke's head in with a rock? I think he did. I, I think I think Jace did say he was trying to kill Luke or something. Well, one of the boys said he was trying to kill them, so... I think they tried to say that, but yeah, the children did not communicate very well. But also, like, who cares? Like, they all were in on the brawl. You know, I, I don't know if it would really benefit anyone for them to try and litigate who did what exactly. I think, I, I mean, I mean, Amond was a giant dickhead, but, like, the other kids also were involved. I don't know. It's not going to make anyone happy. Like, Amond lost an eye. Like, what do you want? Bubba says, do you think we will see any stories that will allow us to see live action versions of the Far East or South? There are a lot of different uh, spin-offs happening. I mean, the Nymeria's 10,000 Ships spin-off show that they have started developing, um, that would visit Sothorios, so that would be cool. And they're also talking about a Nine Voyages show about Corlys, and that would go to yt and ashai and lots of places so theoretically yeah we could see some of those exotic locales in live action 
KC says, why did Amond blame Aegon instead of Alicent? Not sure what you mean. Curtis says, not killing Lenor felt like a cop-out. Uh, I, I think that, like... Part of why I like sparing Lenor is that we don't want too much repetition. Like, I, I think that the reason why uh, Lena Valarion died by dragon last episode instead of just dying in childbirth as um, she did in the books is that Emma Aaron just died in childbirth in episode one and they don't want two characters dying exactly the same way. It's kind of boring and repetitive and pointless. Um Lainor is one of many characters who is allegedly murdered in the books. Uh, there's going to be lots of murders in this series so far and in future. And I think that by adding some interesting deviations and subtleties like, hey, Lainor's actually alive. Like that, that creates a bit of that's that's more interesting than if everyone's just, well, he got murdered, then he got murdered, then she got murdered. You know, I like the variety. Manny says, Rhaenyra and Lenor were made to look more good in this episode. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, and I agree with you that it's good that they said multiple times that Lenor and Rhaenyra did try to conceive a child together. Because that is one of, you know, it would have been a lot better for everyone if Lenor and Rhaenyra had a true-born child who looked Valyrian. Because then this whole issue of bastardy and questioned inheritance would not be as much of an issue. Um, so, yeah, it does make them look more good that they're like, yeah, like we did try to make a child, but we couldn't. And I wonder if that's like, I don't know, without getting too graphic, um, I wonder why that didn't work. Because like, I mean, you know, obviously Lenor's gay, but, you know, in Game of Thrones, Marjorie was saying that like, hey, like Loras, I mean, Renly, why don't you just like get warmed up with Loras and then you can impregnate me? Um Maybe Lenor and Rhaenyra could have tried something like that. Or maybe Lenor is infertile, and maybe that's why he couldn't produce children. Um, who knows? Hildra says that Daemon was pretty calm this episode. Yeah, Daemon, I think, was um, still in his sort of relaxed mode after his marriage with Lena. But I think that re-embracing Rhaenyra really uh, puts him back on a path of fire and blood. Juan says, do you think that Laris knows that Lenor is alive? That's a good question. Um, because Laris does know things that he has no right knowing. Like, how did Laris know that Melos gave Rhaenyra tea previously? So, you know, if Laris has a network of spies or if he has skin changing powers, however he knows what he knows, maybe he's also aware about Lenor and maybe Lenor is in danger. Rhaenyra said multiple times she tried to have kids with Lenor. Yep, we did talk about that as well. Um, it does make Rhaenyra seem more heroic and Alicent more villainous this episode, I think. Nimbus says, is Melisandre alive during this time? We don't know exactly how old Melisandre is. Uh, Carice, the actor in the show, said that she's hundreds of years old. In the books, it's like implied that she might be very old, but it's not clear. So... It is possible, yeah, that Melisandre is alive. She might look different. She could be played by a different actor because I think that Melisandre's appearance is a glamour. It's a magical illusion. Um, and are there other re red priestesses? Yeah, I mean, the religion of R'hllor has been around for a long time. So there are lots of red priests, especially in places like Volantis. Um, but there's not a lot of red priests and priestesses in Westeros. Uh, Christian says, in the book, Slaynor was killed by Carl, but the show probably made it so that the Maesters believed it. Yeah, the Maesters are often wrong about their interpretations of history. Tommy says, Daemon and Rhaenyra are really the main characters. Yeah, I, I think that Rhaenyra is probably meant to be, or sort of, I, I think is the most sympathetic main central character. But she has done a lot wrong as well, like, you know, from the varsity and the lies and from then on. So, uh, I mean, Daemon is also a very central character, but he is a murderer. Like, he's murdered quite a lot of people. <laughs> he's, he's a chaotic dickhead. So, you know, he's, he might not be as sympathetic as the others. Um, KC says, why did Aemon say he heard the bastard thing from his brother? I don't know. He was being honest. Like, he's a child. The, the king is confronting him. Um, and I think that he probably did hear it from his brother. Aegon is exactly the sort of person who would say that, uh, the Strongs are bastards. Uh, I, and Alicent might not ever have said to Aemond that the Strongs are bastards. So I, I think Aemond was probably telling the truth. 
Uh, Sasha says that Alicent doesn't like that the second in line is a bastard, but Rhaenyra is the heir. In theory, she could still have legitimate sons once queen. Yeah, well, if Rhaenyra marries Daemon, um, and if if Rhaenyra has children with Daemon, they would be trueborn children. And according to the laws, those trueborn children would inherit the throne ahead of Rhaenyra's bastard children. So, in theory, uh, Rhaenyra and Daemon having kids solves everything. <laughs> But of course, in practice, it will not solve everything because people have feelings uh, and grudges and ambitions and uh, axes to grind. So uh, I, I suspect that it might just make things more complicated. But I mean, you know, it is an interesting question. Like if Daemon and Rhaenyra have kids, will Daemon want those kids to inherit the throne ahead of Jace, Luke and Joffrey? So maybe Daemon wants people to see Jace, Luke, and Joffrey as bastards. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Vasun says the Greens need a bit more sympathy or support. Yeah, I think that uh, Alicent and her side seem more villainous. And I mean, that is something that people say about the book, is that sometimes the Greens seem more like the villainous side. So we'll see if the show changes that or, or what. Gabriel says, did Daemon actually want Lainor dead? I think that uh, the plan was to let Lainor and Carl go free. VA says that Viserys, if Viserys discovered how Otto was placing Alicent in front of him, wouldn't that somewhat delegitimate her kids? I mean, in like an emotional sense, like, yeah, Viserys knows that Otto put Alicent in front of him. So it's like, he, he might not like that whole union and those children as much like he might not want Aegon to be heir given that Aegon is the product of Otto's manipulations in a sense like I see what you're saying but uh he made the kids the kids exist and uh you know he does love Alicent still you know I mean what's interesting is that Viserys made Otto hand of the king again even though he already realized that Otto was manipulative so he's just gotten over that has he like, I wonder if Otto just sort of muscled his way in and Viserys is like, fine, okay, whatever, take it. You can be handed the king. And Viserys, you know, he, he's mistaking Alison for Emma. Like, he's got a bit of dementia. Like, maybe he just wasn't... Maybe his mind was not together enough to realize that he shouldn't make Otto hand of the king. Lots of speculation there. Uh, user says, can someone claim sea smoke if Lenor isn't dead? I, I think that that's an open question because there's never been a dragon that's been claimed by a new rider while the old rider is still alive. So um, it's a mystery. Okay, we're going to end it here. Um, Tambulay says Lenor was killed by Carl. So they assumed that's how it went down. Yeah, they, they, they covered up the, the escape of Lenor so the maesters wouldn't know that Lenor is still alive. Okay. Thank you so much for participating, everybody. Um, thank you for the super chats. Let's have a quick look at the on the next episode preview, and then we're going to end the stream. Uh, so if you do not want to see the on the next episode trailer preview thing, then you might like to look away now. We're just going to have a quick glance and then we're going to end the stream. Please press like and subscribe. Um, and whatever you do, don't check out the alt shift X YouTube channel. Um, and uh, by the way, if you're looking for other cool analysis of this show, you might like to check out uh, History of Westeros and the Ringer podcast that we mentioned in this stream uh, if you're looking for more good hot D analysis. Okay, let's look at the preview. So there is a ship. I like them. It's got a little, got a little dome in it. That looks great. Uh, Otto appears to be asserting his authority as the Hand of the King. Uh, the Hand of the King sometimes sits on the Iron Throne to uh, represent the King and the King's power when the King is uh, unwell. And I think that Viserys may increasingly be unwell in the near future. So Otto might be uh, making moves to support his daughter and undermine Rhaenyra, which will be interesting to see. Rhaenyra is still here. Uh, there's been a time skip, by the way. We've jumped ahead several years. Uh, so that's uh, Jace or Luke, and that's Baylor or Rayner. They're played by new actors. I know that some people have been annoyed by the time skips because they're a bit disorienting with the new actors and everything changing. But I, I think that this is the last big time skip. I think this is the last time skip that will recast actors. 
I think these actors are the ones that we uh, can actually finally get attached to because they're going to stick around as long as anyone will stick around in this show. Uh, the Hightowers land their first blow. Ooh, what blow were they landing? Oh, look at the grown-up kids. So there's grown-up uh, Amond Targaryen. He lost his eye in this episode. Now in the next episode, he's got a fetching eye patch like Euron Greyjoy. Uh, we've got Aegon here and we've got Helena. Side Hightower, all grown up. And look at the Faith of the Seven necklace that Alicent has there. That's great. So the Faith of the Seven is is the religion that Alicent follows. And I think that, you know, embracing the symbolism of the faith is a smart political move for Alicent. Because she's saying that I'm the religious one. I'm the one who follows the rules. I'm the one that's not sinful. Unlike that sinful, rule-breaking, bastard, bastard having Rhaenyra Targaryen. And, you know... The faith is associated with Old Town and, and the High Towers, so it makes sense for her to do that as like a bit of political symbolism. Uh, Aegon there, yeah, more Faith of the Seven stuff. Maybe this is about the marriage of Aegon and, Hel- and Helena. Maybe that's what this is. Alicent looking quite powerful and political with her outfit here and looking very green, uh, which indicates, you know, they're against the Blacks. Rhaenyra is talking about Otto and the High Towers. You know, basically running running the show politically uh, in Viserys's name. I wonder if Viserys has lost any more body parts. I hope Viserys is doing well. Uh, Daemon says to King's Landing. So are they on Dragonstone at the moment? Maybe they hang on. Ha- maybe they hang out on Dragonstone for a while. But in the meantime, Otto shores up Hightower power on King's Landing. Is that? Viserys in childbed? What is with the desaturated grey look? Is that like a dream or something? There's like fog everywhere? That's mysterious and cool. Uh, The sea smoke has taken a grave wound. In the books, he just like gets sick because he's very old. The sea snake is very old at this point. Like, I think he's like 70 or 80 around this era. Um, He's an old man in the books. I hope that they make him look old because he should be old. Uh, he's taken a wound, and that raises the question of who gets to inherit his castle. High Tide and Driftmark, who, who gets to be the next lord of the Valerions? And I think Vaymond is setting himself up as a claimant to Driftmark. But, you know, we know that Rhaenys wants Bela, uh, to wants, wants her granddaughter Bela to inherit Driftmark. So there may be some conflict there. Who will take the Driftwood throne, the throne of House Valerion? Uh, Viserys says the House of the Dragon can't be united, can't be, uh, in conflicted, but it is divided. Uh, Jace and Luke's new actors here. They're gonna be significant, all grown up. What is that blurry thing? Daemon is taking a dragon egg. I wonder who Daemon is getting a dragon egg for. What is Daemon going to do with that dragon egg? Um, maybe he's getting it for Rainer. Maybe his daughter Raina is going to get that dragon egg so that she can finally get a dragon. Ooh, Mazaria. Mazaria is back. Mazaria, the white worm and some hooded figure. Is that Daemon in that hood? Or is that one of Mazaria's spies, one of her informants? Will Mazaria still be working with Otto Hightower? What is the deal? Uh, Amond is looking deranged in this scene, which I absolutely love. He's looking quite freaky and scary, and he says nephews, so I guess he's referring to Jace and Luke, the people who cut out his eye. So Amond is probably not very friendly with those people, uh, and it looks like there's a fight between Jace and Luke and Amond and Aegon. So, uh, yeah, the House of the Dragon is sure looking divided, Viserys. The threat of war looms. We're starting to get real. Vaymond is asserting his power. I reckon he wants Driftmark. And that is what we will see on the next episode. Okay, we're going to end the live stream here. Thank you so much for participating. Like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, everyone. And I apologize uh, for any super chats that I missed. And have a good one. Till next time. See you. Cheers.